Section 18 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie van Mulligan. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 18. The Borgias, Chapter Ten, Part One. The French army was now preparing to cross the Alps a second time, under the command of Trivuls. Louis the Twelfth had come as far as Lyon in the company of Cesar Borgia and Giuliano della Rovere, in whom he had forced a reconciliation, and towards the beginning of the month of May had sent his vanguard before him soon to be followed by the main body of the army. The forces he was employing in the second campaign of conquest were sixteen hundred lances, five thousand Swiss, nine thousand Gascons, and three thousand five hundred infantry, raised from all parts of France. On the thirteenth of August, this whole body, amounting to nearly fifteen thousand men, where to combine their forces with the Venetians, arrived beneath the walls of Arezzo, and immediately laid siege to the town. Ludovico Sforza's position was a terrible one. He was now suffering from his imprudence in calling the French into Italy. All the allies he had thought he might count upon were abandoning him at the same moment, either because they were busy about their own affairs, or because they were afraid of the powerful enemy that the Duke of Milan had made for himself. Maximilian, who had promised him a contribution of four hundred lances to make up for not renewing the hostilities with Louis the Twelfth, that had been interrupted, had just made a liege with the circle of Swabia to war against the Swiss, whom he had declared rebels against the empire. The Florentines, who had engaged to furnish him with three hundred men-at-arms and two thousand infantry, if he would help them to retake Pisa, had just retracted their promise because of Louis the Twelfth's threats, and had undertaken to remain neutral. Frederick, who was holding back his troops for the defence of his own states, because he supposed, not without reason, that Milan once conquered, he would again have to defend Naples, sent him no help, no men, no money, in spite of his promises. Ludovico Sforza was therefore reduced to his own proper forces. But as he was a man powerful in arms and clever in artifice, he did not allow himself to succumb at the first blow, and in all haste fortified Anonna, Novarro, and Alessandria, sent off Gaggiazzo with troops, to that part of the Milanese territory which borders on the states of Venice, and collected on the Po as many troops as he could. But these precautions availed him nothing against the impetuous onslaught of the French, who in a few days had taken Anonna, Arezzo, Novaro, Vogera, Casalnuovo, Ponte Corona, Tartone, and Alessandria, while Trivuls was on the march to Milan. Seeing the rapidity of this conquest and their numerous victories, Ludovico Sforza, despairing of holding out in his capital, resolved to retire to Germany with his children, his brother, Cardinal Ascanio Sforza, and his treasure, which had been reduced in the course of eight years, from one and a half million to two hundred ducats. But before he went, he left Bernardino da Carte, in charge of the castle of Milan. In vain did his friends warn him to distrust this man. In vain did his brother Ascanio offer to hold the fortress himself, and offer to hold it to the very last. Ludovico refused to make any change in his arrangements, and started on the 2nd of September, leaving in the citadel three thousand foot, and enough provisions, ammunition, and money to sustain a siege of several months. Two days after Ludovico's departure, the French entered Milan. Ten days later, 
Bernardino de Carte gave up the castle before a single gun had been fired. Twenty-one days had sufficed for the French to get possession of the various towns, the capital, and all the territories of their enemy. Louis the Twelfth received the news of this success while he was at Lyon, and he at once started for Milan, where he was received with demonstrations of joy that were really sincere. Citizens of every rank had come out three miles distance from the gates to receive him, and forty boys, dressed in cloth of gold and silk, marched before him, singing hymns of victory, composed by poets of the period, in which the king was styled the liberator and the envoy of freedom. The great joy of the Milanese people was due to the fact that friends of Louis had been spreading reports beforehand that the king of France was rich enough to abolish all taxes, and so soon as the second day from his arrival at Milan, the conqueror made some slight reduction, granted important favours to certain Milanese gentlemen, and bestowed the town of Vigavano on Trivuls as a reward for his swift and glorious campaign. But Cesar Borgia, who had followed Louis the Twelfth with a view to playing his part in the great hunting ground of Italy, scarcely waited for him to attain his end, when he claimed the fulfilment of his promise, which the king, with his accustomed loyalty, hastened to perform. He instantly put at the disposal of Cesar three hundred lances under the command of Yves d'Allegre, and four thousand Swiss, under the command of the bailiff of Dijon, as a help in his work of reducing the vicars of the church. We must now explain to our readers who these new personages were, whom we introduce upon the scene by the above name. During the eternal wars of Galbs and Ghibellines, and the long exile of the popes at Avignon, most of the towns and fortresses of the Romagna had been usurped by petty tyrants, who, for the most part, had received from the empire the investiture of their new possessions. But ever since German influence had retired beyond the Alps, and the popes had again made Rome the centre of the Christian world, all the small princes, robbed of their original protector, had rallied round the papal see, and received at the hands of the pope a new investiture, and now they paid annual dues, for which if they received the particular title of duke, count, or lord, and the general name of vicar of the church. It had been no difficult matter for Alexander, scrupulously examining the actions and behaviour of these gentlemen during the seven years that had elapsed since he was exalted to St. Peter's throne, to find in the conduct of each one of them something that could be called an infraction of the treaty between vessels and suzerain. Accordingly, he brought forward his complaints at a tribunal established for the purpose, and obtained sentence from the judges, to the effect that the vicars of the church, having failed to fulfil the conditions of their investiture, were despoiled of their domains, which would again become the property of the Holy See. As if the Pope was now dealing with men against whom it was easier to pass a sentence than to get it carried out, he had nominated as Captain-General the new Duke of Valentinois, who was commissioned to recover the territories for his own benefit. The lords in question were the Maladesti of Rimini, the Sforza of Pesaro, the Manfredi of Venza, the Riari of Imola and Farli, the Variani of Camerina, the Montefeltri of Urbino, and the Cetani of Sermoneta. But the Duke of Valentinois, eager to keep as warm as possible his great friendship with his ally and relative Louis the Twelfth, was, as we know, staying with him at Milan so long as he remained there, where, after a month's occupation, the king retraced his steps to his own capital. The Duke of Valentinois ordered his men at arms, and his Swiss to await him between Parma and Modena, and departed post haste for Rome, to explain his plans to his father, Viva Voce, and to receive his final instructions. When he arrived, he found that the fortune of his sister Lucrezia 
had been greatly augmented in his absence, not from the side of her husband Alfonso, whose future was very uncertain now in consequence of Louise's successes, which had caused some coolness between Alfonso and the Pope, but from her father's side, upon whom at this time she exercised an influence more astonishing than ever. The Pope had declared Lucretia Borgia of Aragon, life governor of Spoleto, and its duchy, with all emoluments, rights, and revenues accruing thereunto. This had so greatly increased her power and improved her position, that in these days she never showed herself in public without a company of two hundred horses, ridden by the most illustrious ladies and noblest knights of Rome. Moreover, as a twofold affection of her father was a secret to nobody, the first relates in the church, the frequenters of the Vatican, the friends of His Holiness, were all her most humble servants. Cardinals gave her their hands when she stepped from her litter or her horse. Archbishop disputed the honour of celebrating Mass in her private apartments. But Lucretia had been obliged to quit Rome in order to take possession of her new estates, and as her father could not spend much time away from his beloved daughter, he resolved to take into his hands the town of Nepi, which on a former occasion, as the reader will doubtless remember, he had bestowed on Ascanio Sforza in exchange for his suffrage. Ascanio had naturally lost this town when he attached himself to the fortunes of the Duke of Milan, his brother, and when the Pope was about to take it again, he invited his daughter Lucrezia to join him there and be present at the rejoicings held in honour of his resuming its possession. Lucrezia's readiness in giving way to her father's wishes brought her a new gift from him. This was a town and territory of Sermoneta, which belonged to the Gedani. Of course the gift was yet a secret, because the two owners of the signori had first to be disposed of, one being Monsignore Giacomo Gedano, apostolic pronotary, the other Prospero Gedano, a young cavalier of great promise, but as both lived at Rome and entertained no suspicion, but indeed supposed themselves to be in high favour with his holiness, the one by virtue of his position, the other of his courage, the matter seemed to present no great difficulty. So, directly after the return of Alexander to Rome, Giacomo Cetano was arrested, on what pretext we know not, was taken to the castle of Sant'Angelo, and there died shortly after of poison. Prospero Cetano was strangled in his own house. After these two deaths, which, which both occurred so suddenly as to give no time for either to make a will, the people declared that Ser Moneta and, and all of her property appertaining to the Cetani devolved upon the apostolic chamber, and they were sold to Lucretia for the sum of eighty thousand crowns, which her father refunded to her the day after. Though Cesar hurried to Rome, he found when he arrived that his father had been beforehand with him, and had made the beginning of his conquests. Another fortune also had been making prodigious strides during Cesar's stay in France, viz. the fortune of John Borgia, the Pope's nephew, who had been one of the most devoted friends of the Duke of Gandia up to the time of his death. It was said in Rome, and not in a whisper, that the young cardinal owed the favours heaped upon him by his holiness less to the memory of the brother than to the protection of the sister. Both these reasons made John Borgia a special object of suspicion to Cesar, and it was with an inward vow that he should not enjoy his new dignities very long that the Duke of Valentinois heard that his cousin John had just been nominated Cardinal Aladere of all the Christian world, and had quitted Rome to make a circuit through all the pontifical states with a suit of archbishops, bishops, prelates, and gentlemen, such as would have done honour to the Pope himself. Cesar had only come to Rome to get news, so he only stayed three days, and then, 
with all the troops his holiness could supply, rejoined his forces on the borders of the Udza, and marched at once to Imola. This town, abandoned by its chiefs, who had retired to Forli, was forced to capitulate. Imola taken, Cesar marched straight upon Forli. There he met with a serious check, a check, moreover, which came from a woman, Caterina Sforza, widow of Girolamo and mother of Ottaviano Riario, had retired to this town, and stirred up the courage of the garrison by putting herself, her goods, and her person under their protection. Cesar saw that it was no longer a question of a sudden capture, but of a regular siege, so he began to make all his arrangements with a view to it, and, placing a battery of cannon in front of the place where the wall seemed to him the weakest, he ordered an uninterrupted fire to be continued until the breach was practicable. When he returned to the camp after giving this order, he found there Gian Borgia, who had gone to Rome from Ferrara, and was unwilling to be so near Cesar, without paying him a visit. He was received with effusion, and apparently the greatest joy, and stayed three days. On the fourth day, all the officers and members of the court were invited to a grand farewell supper, and Cesar bade farewell to his cousin, charging him with dispatches for the Pope, and lavishing upon him all the tokens of affection he had shown on his arrival. Cardinal Gian Borgia posted off as soon as he left the supper-table, but on arriving at Urbino he was seized with such a sudden and strange indisposition that he was forced to stop. But after a few minutes, feeling rather better, he went on. Scarcely, however, had he entered Rocca Cantrada, when he again felt so extremely ill that he resolved to go no farther and stayed a couple of days in the town. And then, as he thought he was a little better again, and as he had heard the news of the taking of Forli, and also that Caterina Sforza had been taken prisoner while she was making an attempt to retire into the castle, he resolved to go back to Cesar and congratulate him on his victory. But at Fasambrani he was forced to stop a third time, although he had given up his carriage for a litter, this was his last halt. The same day he sought his bed, never to rise from it again. Three days later he was dead. His body was taken to Rome and buried without any ceremony in the church of Santa Maria del Popolo, where lay awaiting him the corpse of his friend, the Duke of Gandia, and there was now no more talk of the young cardinal, high as his rank had been, than if he had never existed. Thus, in gloom and silence, passed away all those who were swept to destruction by the ambition of that terrible trio, Alexander, Lucrezia, and Cesar. End of section 18《セクション19の Celebrated Crimes Vol.1》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shaliva Maliam.《Celebrated Crimes Vol.1 》by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 19. The Borgias. Chapter 10, Part 2. Almost at the same time, Rome was terrified by another murder. Don Giovanni Gervilioni, a gentleman by birth and a brave soldier, captain of the Pope's men-at-arms, was attacked one evening by the Spiri, as he was on his way home from supping with Don Alessio Pignatelli. One of the men asked his name, and, as he pronounced it, seeing that there was no mistake, plunged a dagger into his breast, while a second man with a back stroke of his sword cut off his head, which lay actually at his feet, before his body had time to fall. The governor of Rome lodged a complaint against this assassination with the Pope, 
but quickly perceiving by the way his intimation was received that he would have done better to say nothing he stopped the inquiries he had started so that neither of the murderers was ever arrested but the rumour was circulated that cesar in the short stay he had made at rome had had a rendezvous with with Chaviglioni's wife who was a borgia by birth and that her husband when he heard of this infringement of conjugal duty had been angry enough to threaten her and her lover too the threat had reached cesar's ears who making a long arm of michelotto had himself at forli struck down Cerviglioni in the street of rome another unexpected death followed so quickly on that of don giovanni Cerviglioni that it could not but be attributed to the same originator if not the same cause monsignore agnelli of mantua archbishop of cotenza clerk of the chamber and vice legate of viterbo having fallen into disgrace with his holiness how it is not known was poisoned at his own table at which he had passed a good part of the night in cheerful conversation with three or four guests the poison gliding meanwhile through his veins then going to bed in perfect health he was found dead in the morning his possessions were at once divided into three portions the land and houses were given to the duke of valentinois the bishopric went to francesco borgia son of calixtus the third and the office of clerk of the chamber was sold for five thousand ducats to ventura bonassai a merchant of siena who produced this sum for alexander and settled down the very same day in the vatican this last death served the purpose of determining a point of law hitherto uncertain as monsignore arnelli's natural heirs had made some difficulty about being disinherited alexander issued a brief whereby he took from every cardinal and every priest the right of making a will and declared that all their property should henceforth devolve upon him but cesar was stopped short in the midst of his victories thanks to the two hundred thousand ducats that yet remained in his treasury ludovico sforza had levied five hundred men-at-arms from burgundy and eight thousand swiss infantry with whom he had entered lombardy so trivuls to face of this enemy had been compelled to call back yves de Legre and the troops that louis the twelfth had lent to cesar consequently cesar leaving behind a body of pontifical soldiery as garrison at forli and imola betook himself with the rest of his force to rome it was alexander's wish that his entry should be triumph so when he learned that the quartermasters of the army were only a few leagues from the town he sent out runners to invite the royal ambassadors the cardinals the prelates the roman barons and municipal dignitaries to make procession with all their suite to meet the duke of valentinois and as it always happens that the pride of those who command is surpassed by the baseness of those who obey the orders were not only fulfilled to the latter but beyond it the entry of cesar took place on the twenty sixth of february fifteen hundred although this was the great jubilee year the festivals of the carnival began none the less for that and were conducted in a manner even more extravagant and licentious than usual and the conqueror after the first day prepared a new display of ostentation which he concealed under the veil of a masquerade as he was pleased to identify himself with the glory genius and fortune of the great man whose name he bore he resolved on a representation of the triumph of julius cesar to be given on the piazza di navona the ordinary place for holding the carnival fete the next day therefore he and his retinue started from that square and traversed all the streets of rome wearing classical costumes and riding in antique cars on one of which cesar stood clad in the robe of an emperor of old his brow crowned with a golden laurel wreath surrounded by lictors soldiers and ensign bearers who carried banners whereon was inscribed the motto out kaiser out nihil 
Finally, on the fourth Sunday in Lent, the Pope conferred upon Cesar the dignity he had so long coveted, and appointed him General and John Falonieri of the Holy Church. In the meanwhile, Sforza had crossed the Alps and passed the Lake of Como, amid acclamations of joy from his former subjects, who had quickly lost the enthusiasm that the French army and Louise's promises had inspired. These demonstrations were so noisy at Milan, that Trivuls, judging that there was no safety for a French garrison in remaining there, made his way to Navarra. Experience proved that he was not deceived, for scarcely had the Milanese observed his preparation for departure, when a suppressed excitement began to spread through the town, and soon the streets were filled with armed men. This murmuring crowd had to be passed through, sword in hand and lance in rest, and scarcely had the French got outside the gates when the mob rushed out after the army into the country, pursuing them with shouts and hooting as far as the banks of the Ticino. Trivius left four hundred lances at Novaro, as well as three thousand Swiss, that Yves de Lega had brought from the Romagna, and directed his course with the rest of the army towards Mortara, where he stopped at last to await the help he had demanded from the King of France. Behind him, Cardinal Ascanio and Ludovico entered Milan amid the acclamations of the hill town. Neither of them lost any time, and wishing to profit by this enthusiasm, Ascanio undertook to besiege the castle of Milan, while Ludovico should cross up the Ticino and attack Novaro. Their besiegers and besieged were sons of the same nation, for Yves d'Allegre had scarcely as many as three hundred French with him, and Ludovico five hundred Italians. In fact, for the last sixteen years, the Swiss had been practically the only infantry in Europe, and all the powers came, purse in hand, to draw from the mighty reservoir of their mountains. The consequence was that these rude children of William Tell, put up to auction by the nations, and carried away from the humble hardy life of a mountain people, into cities of wealth and pleasure, had lost not their ancient courage, but that rigidity of principle for which they had been distinguished before their intercourse with other nations. From being models of honour and good faith, they had become a kind of marketable ware, always ready for sale to the highest bidder. The French were the first to experience this venality, which later on proved so fatal to Ludovico Sforza. Now, the Swiss in the garrison at Novara had been in communication with their compatriots in the vanguard of the ducal army, and when they found that they, who as a fact were unaware that Ludovico's treasure was nearly exhausted, were better fed as well as better paid than themselves, they offered to give up the town and go over to the Milanese if they could be certain of the same pay. Ludovico, as we may well suppose, closed with his bargain. The whole of Novara was given up to him except the citadel, which was defended by Frenchmen. Thus the enemy's army was recruited by three thousand men. Then Ludovico made the mistake of stopping to besiege the castle instead of marching on to Mortara with a new reinforcement. The result of this was that Louis the Twelfth, to whom runners had been sent by Trivuls, understanding his perilous position, hastened the departure of the French gendarmerie, who were already collected to cross into Italy, sent off the bailiff of Dijon to levy new Swiss forces, and ordered Cardinal Amboise, his prime minister, to cross at the Alps and take up a position at Asti, to hurry on the work of collecting the troops. There the cardinal found a nest egg of three thousand men. La Trimouille added fifteen hundred lances and six thousand French infantry. Finally, the bailiff of Dijon arrived with ten thousand Swiss, so that, counting the troops which Trivuls had at Mortara, Louis the Twelfth found himself master on the other side of the Alps of the first army any French king had ever led out to battle. Soon, by good marching, and before Ludovico knew the strength of or even the existence of this army, it took up a position between Novara and Milan, 
cutting off all communication between the duke and his capital. He was, therefore, compelled, in spite of his inferior numbers, to prepare for a pitched battle. But it so happened that just when the preparations for a decisive engagement were being made on both sides, the Swiss diet, learning that the sons of Helvetia were on the paint of cutting one another's throats, sent orders to all the Swiss serving in either army to break their engagements and return to the fatherland. But during the two months that had passed between the surrender of Novara and the arrival of the French army before the town, there had been a very great change in the face of things, because Ludovico Sforza's treasure was now exhausted. New confabulations had gone on between the outposts, and this time, thanks to the money sent by Louis the Twelfth, it was the Swiss in the service of France who were found to be the better fed and the better paid. The worthy Helvetians, since they no longer fought for their own liberty, knew the value of their blood too well to allow a single drop of it to be spilt for less than its weight in gold. The result was that, as they had betrayed Yves de Legre, they resolved to betray Ludovico Sforza too, and while the recruits brought in by the bailiff of Dijon were standing firmly by the French flag, careless of the order of the diet, Ludovico's auxiliaries declared that in fighting against their Swiss brethren, they would be acting in disobedience to the diet, and would risk capital punishment in the end, a danger that nothing would induce them to incur unless they immediately received the arrears of their pay. The duke, who had spent the last ducat he had with him, and was entirely cut off from his capital, knew that he could not get money till he had fought his way through to it, and therefore invited the Swiss to make one last effort, promising them not only the pay that was in arrears, but a double hire. But, unluckily, the fulfilment of this promise was dependent on the doubtful issue of a battle, and the Swiss replied that they had far too much respect for their country to disobey its decree, and that they loved their brothers far too well to consent to shed their blood without reward, and therefore Sforza would do well not to count upon them, since, indeed, the very next day they proposed to return to their homes. The duke then saw that all was lost, but he made a last appeal to their honour, adjuring them at least to ensure his personal safety, by making it a condition of capitulation. But they replied that even if a condition of such a kind would not make capitulation impossible, it would certainly deprive them of advantages which they had a right to expect, and on which they counted as indemnification for the arrears of their pay. They pretended, however, at last, that they were touched by the prayers of the man whose orders they had obeyed so long, and offered to conceal him, dressed in their clothes among their ranks. This proposition was barely plausible, for Sforza was short, and by this time an old man, and he could not possibly escape recognition in the midst of an army where the oldest was not past thirty, and the shortest not less than five foot six. Still, this was his last chance, and he did not reject it at once, but tried to modify it, so that it might help him in his trades. His plan was to disguise himself as a Franciscan monk, so that, mounted on a shabby horse, he might pass for their chaplain. The others, Galeazzo di San Severino, who commanded under him and his two brothers, were all tall men, so, adopting the dress of common soldiers, they hoped they might escape detection in the Swiss ranks. Scarcely were these plans settled, when the Duke heard that a capitulation was signed between Trivulse and the Swiss, who had made no stipulation in favour of him and his generals. They were to go over the next day with arms and baggage right into the French army, so the last hope of the wretched Ludovico and his generals must needs be in their disguise. And so it was. San Severino and his brothers took their place in the ranks of the infantry, and Sforza took his among the baggage, clad in a monk's frock, with a hood pulled over his eyes. The army marched off, but the Swiss, who had first trafficked in their blood, 
now trafficked in their honour. The French were warned of the disguise of Svorta and his generals, and thus they were all four recognised, and Svorta was arrested by Trimouille himself. It is said that the price paid for this treason was a town of Bellindona, for it then belonged to the French, and when the Swiss returned to their mountains and took possession of it, Louis the Twelfth took no steps to get it back again. When Ascanio Sforza, who, as we know, had stayed at Milan, learned the news of this cowardly desertion, he supposed that his cause was lost, and that it would be the best plan for him to fly, before he found himself a prisoner in the hands of his brother's old subjects. Such a change of face on the people's part would be very natural, and they might propose perhaps to purchase their own pardon at the price of his liberty. So he fled by night with the chief nobles of the Dribbeline party, taking the road to Piacenza on his way to the kingdom of Naples. But when he arrived at Rivolta, he remembered that there was living in that town an old friend of his childhood, by name Conrad Lando, whom he had helped to much wealth in his days of power, and as Ascanio and his companions were extremely tired, he resolved to beg his hospitality for a single night. Conrad received them with every sign of joy, putting all his house and servants at their disposal. But scarcely had they retired to bed, when he sent a runner to Piacenza to inform Carlo Orsini, at that time commanding the Venetian garrison, that he was prepared to deliver up Cardinal Ascanio and the chief men of the Milanese army. Carlo Orsini did not care to resign to another so important an expedition, and, mounting hurriedly with twenty-five men, he first surrounded Conrad's house, and then entered, sword in hand, the chamber wherein Ascanio and his companions lay, and being surprised in the middle of their sleep, they yielded without resistance. The prisoners were taken to Venice, but Louis the Twelfth claimed them, and they were given up. Thus the King of France found himself master of Ludovico Sforza, and of Ascanio, of a legitimate nephew of the great Francesco Sforza, named Hermes, of the two bastards, named Alessandro and Cortino, and of Francesco, son of the unhappy John Galeazza, who had been poisoned by his uncle. Louis the Twelfth, wishing to make an end of the whole family at a blow, forced Francesco to enter cloister, shut up Cardinal Ascanio in the tower of Borges, threw into prison Alessandro, Cortino, and Hermes, and finally, after transferring the wretched Ludovico from the fortress of pierre Cise to Lys saint georges he relegated him for good and all to the castle of Locher, where he lived for ten years in solitude and utter destitution, and there died, cursing the day when the idea first came into his head of enticing the French into Italy. The news of the catastrophe of Ludovico and his family caused the greatest joy at Rome, for, while the French were consolidating their power in Milanese territory, the Holy See was gaining ground in the Romagna, where no further opposition was offered to Cesar's conquest. So the runners who brought the news were rewarded with a valuable presents, and it was published throughout the whole town of Rome to the sound of the trumpet and drum. The war cry of Louis, France, and that of Orsina also, ran through all the streets, which in the evening were illuminated, as though Constantinople or Jerusalem had been taken. And the Pope gave the people fetes and fireworks, without troubling his head the least in the world, either about its being a holy week, or because the Jubilee had attracted more than two hundred thousand people to Rome, the temporal interests of his family seeming to him far more important than the spiritual interests of his subjects. End of section 19。section 20 of celebrated crimes volume 1 。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。Please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Celebrated Crimes, Volume One by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section Twenty. The Borges, Chapter Eleven, Part One. One thing alone was wanting to assure the success of the vast projects that the Pope and his son were founding upon the friendship of Louis and an alliance with him, that is, money. But Alexander was not the man to be troubled about a paltry worry of that kind. True, the sale of benefices was by now exhausted, the ordinary and extraordinary taxes had already been collected for the whole year, and the prospect of inheritance from cardinals and priests was a poor thing now that the richest of them had been poisoned but Alexander had other means at his disposal, which were none the less efficacious because they were less often used. The first he employed was to spread a report that the Turks were threatening an invasion of Christendom, and that he knew for a positive fact that before the end of the summer Bajazet would land two considerable armies, one in Romagna, the other in Calabria. He therefore published two bulls, one to levy tithes of all ecclesiastical revenues in Europe of whatever nature they might be, the other to force the Jews into paying an equivalent sum. Both bulls contained the severest sentences of excommunication against those who refused to submit, or attempted opposition. The second plan was the selling of indulgences, a thing which had never been done before. These indulgences affected the people who had been prevented by reasons of health or business from coming to Rome for the Jubilee. The journey by this expedient was rendered unnecessary, and sins were pardoned for a third of what it would have cost, and just as completely as if the faithful had fulfilled every condition of the pilgrimage. For gathering in this tax, a veritable army of collectors was instituted, a certain Lodovico della Torre at their head. The sum that Alexander brought into the pontifical treasury is incalculable, and some idea of it may be gathered from the fact that seven hundred and ninety nine thousand livres in gold was paid in from the territory of venice alone but as the turks did as a fact make some sort of demonstration from the hungarian side and the venetians began to fear that they might be coming in their direction they asked for help from the pope who gave orders that at twelve o'clock in the day in all his states an ave maria should be said to pray god to avert the danger which was threatening the most serene republic this was the only help the Venetians got from His Holiness in exchange for the 799,000 livres in gold that he had got from them. But it seemed as though God wished to show his strange vicar on earth that he was angered by the mockery of sacred things, and on the eve of St. Peter's Day, just as the Pope was passing the Campanile on his way to the Tribune of Benedictions, an enormous piece of iron broke off and fell at his feet, and then, as though one warning had not been enough, on the next day, St. Peter's, when the Pope happened to be in one of the rooms of his ordinary dwelling with the Cardinal Capuano and Monsignore Poto, his private chamberlain, he saw through the open windows that a very black cloud was coming up. Foreseeing a thunderstorm, he ordered the Cardinal and the chamberlain to shut the windows. He had not been mistaken, for even as they were obeying his command, there came up such a furious gust of wind that the highest chimney of the Vatican was overturned, just as a tree is rooted up, and was dashed upon the roof, breaking it in, smashing the upper flooring. It fell into the very room where they were. Terrified by the noise of this catastrophe, which made the whole palace tremble, the Cardinal and Monsignore Porto turned round, and seeing the room full of dust and debris, sprang out upon the parapet and shouted to the guards at the gate. The Pope is dead! The Pope is dead! At this cry, the guards ran up and discovered three persons lying in the rubbish on the floor, one dead and the other two dying. The dead man was a gentleman of Siena, called Lorenzo Chigi, and the dying were two resident officials of the Vatican. They had been walking across the floor above, and had been flung down with the debris. But Alexander was not to be found, and as he gave no answer, though they kept on calling to him, the belief that he had perished was confirmed, and very soon spread about the town. But he had only fainted, and at the end of a certain time he began to come to himself, and moaned, whereupon he was discovered, dazed with the blow, and injured, though not seriously, in several parts of his body. He had been saved by little short of a miracle. A beam had broken in half, and had left each of its two ends in the side walls and one of these had formed a sort of roof over the pontifical throne. The Pope, who was sitting there at the time, 
was protected by this overarching beam, and had received only a few contusions. The two contradictory reports of the sudden death and the miraculous preservation of the Pope spread rapidly through Rome, and the Duke of Valentinois, terrified at the thought of what a change might be wrought in his own fortunes by any slight accident to the Holy Father, hurried to the Vatican, unable to assure himself by anything less than the evidence of his own eyes. Alexander desired to render public thanks to heaven for the protection that had been granted him, and on the very same day was carried to the church of Santa Maria del Popolo. Escorted by a numerous procession of prelates and men-at-arms, his pontifical seat borne by two valets, two equerries, and two grooms. In this church were buried the Duke of Gandia and Jan Borgia, and perhaps Alexander was drawn thither by some relics of devotion, or maybe by the recollection of his love for his former mistress, Rosa Bonazza, whose image, in the guise of the Madonna, was exposed for the veneration of the faithful in a chapel on the left of the high altar. Stopping before this altar, the Pope offered to the church the gift of a magnificent chalice in which were three hundred gold crowns, which the Cardinal of Siena poured out into a silver pattern before the eyes of all, much to the gratification of the pontifical vanity. But before he left Rome to complete the conquest of the Romagna, the Duke of Valentinois had been reflecting that the marriage, once so ardently desired, between Lucrezia and Alfonso had been quite useless to himself and his father. There was more than this to be considered. Louis the Twelfth's rest in Lombardy was only a halt, and Milan was evidently but the stage before Naples. It was very possible that Louis was annoyed about the marriage which converted his enemy's nephew into the son-in-law of his ally. Whereas, if Alfonso were dead, Lucrezia would be the position to marry some powerful lord of Ferrara or Brescia, who would be able to help his brother-in-law in the conquest of Romagna. Alfonso was now not only useless but dangerous, which to any one with the character of the Borgias perhaps seemed worse, the death of Alfonso was resolved upon. But Lucrezia's husband, who had understood for a long time past what danger he incurred by living near his terrible father-in-law, had retired to Naples. Since, however, neither Alexander nor Caesar had changed in their perpetual dissimulation towards him, he was beginning to lose his fear when he received an invitation from the Pope and his son to take part in a bullfight which was to be held in the Spanish fashion in honour of the Duke before his departure. In the present precarious position of Naples, it would not have been good policy for Alfonso to afford Alexander any sort of pretext for a rupture, so he could not refuse without a motive, and betook himself to Rome. It was thought of no use to consult Lucrezia in this affair, for she had two or three times displayed an absurd attachment for her husband, and they left her undisturbed in her government of Spoleto. Alfonso was received by the Pope and the Duke with every demonstration of sincere friendship, and rooms in the Vatican were assigned to him that he had inhabited before with Lucrezia, in that part of the building which is known as the Torre Nuova. Great lists were prepared on the piazza of St. Peter's, the streets about it were barricaded, and the windows of the surrounding houses served as boxes for the spectators. The Pope and his court took their places on the balconies of the Vatican. The fate was started by professional toreadors, after they had exhibited their strength and skill. Alfonso and Caesar in their turn descended to the arena, and to offer a proof of their mutual kindness, settled that the bull which pursued Caesar should be killed by Alfonso, and the bull that pursued Alfonso by Caesar. Then Caesar remained alone on horseback within the lists, Alfonso going out by an improvised door which was kept ajar, in order that he might go back on the instant if he judged that his presence was necessary. At the same time, from the opposite side of the lists, the bull was introduced, and was at the same moment pierced all over with darts and arrows, some of them containing explosives, which took fire, and irritated the bull to such a point that he rolled about with pain, and then got up in a fury and perceiving a man on horseback, rushed instantly upon him. It was now, in this narrow arena, pursued by his swift enemy, that Caesar displayed all that skill which made him one of the finest horsemen of the period. Still, clever as he was, he could not have remained safe long in that restricted area from an adversary against whom he had no other resource than flight, had not Alfonso appeared suddenly, just when the bull was beginning to gain upon him, waving a red cloak in his left hand, 
and holding in his right a long, delicate, arrogant sword. It was high time. The bull was only a few paces distant from Caesar, and the risk he was running appeared so imminent that a woman's scream was heard from one of the windows. But at the sight of a man on foot the bull stopped short, and judging that he would do better business with the new enemy than the old one, he turned upon him instead. For a moment he stood motionless, roaring, kicking up the dust with his hind feet, and lashing his sides with his tail. Then he rushed upon Alfonso, his eyes all bloodshot, his horns tearing up the ground. Alfonso awaited him with a tranquil air. Then, when he was only three paces away, he made a bound to one side, and presented instead of his body his sword, which disappeared at once to the hilt. The bull, checked in the middle of his onslaught, stopped one instant motionless and trembling, then fell upon his knees, uttered one dull roar, and lying down on the very spot where his course had been checked, breathed his last without moving a single step forward. Applause resounded on all sides, so rapid and clever had been the blow. Caesar had remained on horseback, seeking to discover the fair spectator who had given so lively a proof of her interest in him, without troubling himself about what was going on. His search had not been unrewarded, for he had recognized one of the maids of honor to Elizabeth, Duchess of Urbino, who was betrothed to Gian Battista Caricuolo, Captain General of the Republic of Venice. It was now Alfonso's turn to run from the ball, Caesar's to fight him. The young men changed parts, and when four mules had reluctantly dragged the dead bull from the arena, and the valets and other servants of his holiness had scattered sand over the places that were stained with blood, Alfonso mounted a magnificent Andalusian steed of Arab origin, light as the wind of Sahara that had wedded with his mother, while Caesar, dismounting, retired in his turn to reappear at the moment when Alfonso should be meeting the same danger from which he had just now rescued him. Then a second bull was introduced upon the scene, excited in the same manner with steel darts and flaming arrows. Like his predecessor, when he perceived a man on horseback, he rushed upon him, and then began a marvellous race, in which it was impossible to see, so quickly did they fly over the ground, whether the horse was pursuing the bull, or the bull the horse. But after five or six rounds, the bull began to gain upon the son of Araby, for all his speed, and it was plain to see who fled and who pursued. In another moment there was only the length of two lances between them, and then suddenly Caesar appeared, armed with one of those long two-handed swords which the French are accustomed to use, and just when the ball, almost close upon Don Alfonso, came in front of Caesar, he brandished the sword, which flashed like lightning and cut off his head, while his body, impelled by the speed of the run, fell to the ground ten paces farther on. This blow was so unexpected, and had been performed with such dexterity, that it was received not with mere clapping, but with wild enthusiasm and frantic outcry. Caesar, apparently remembering nothing else in his hour of triumph but the scream that had been caused by his former danger, picked up the bull's head, and, giving it to one of his equerries, ordered him to lay it, as an act of homage, at the feet of the fair Venetian who had bestowed upon him so lively a sign of interest. This fate, besides affording a triumph to each of the young men, had another end as well. It was meant to prove to the populace that perfect good will existed between the two, since each had saved the life of the other. The result was that, if any accident should happen to Caesar, nobody would dream of accusing Alfonso, and if any accident should happen to Alfonso, nobody would dream of accusing Caesar. There was a supper at the Vatican. Alfonso made an elegant toilet, and about ten o'clock at night prepared to go from the quarters he inhabited into those where the Pope lived. But the door which separated the two courts of the building was shut, and knock as he would, no one came to open it. Alfonso then thought that it was a simple matter for him to go round by the piazza of St. Peter. So he went out unaccompanied through one of the garden gates of the Vatican, and made his way across the gloomy streets which led to the stairway which gave on the piazza. But scarcely had he set foot on the first step when he was attacked by a band of armed men. Alfonso would have drawn his sword, but before it was out of the scabbard he had received two blows from a halberd, one on his head, the other on his shoulder. He was stabbed in the side, and wounded both in the leg and in the temple. Struck down by these five blows, he lost his footing and fell to the ground unconscious. His assassins, supposing he was dead, at once remounted the stairway, and found on the piazza forty horsemen waiting for them. By them they were calmly escorted from the city by the porta Porteza. 
alfonso was found at the point of death but not actually dead by some passers-by some of whom recognized him and instantly conveyed the news of his assassination to the vatican while the others lifting the wounded man in their arms carried him to his quarters in the torre nuova the pope and caesar who learned this news just as they were sitting down to table showed great distress and leaving their companions at once went to see alfonso to be quite certain whether his wounds were fatal or not and on the next morning to divert any suspicion that might be turned towards themselves they arrested alfonso's maternal uncle francesco gazella who had come to rome in his nephew's company gazella was found guilty on the evidence of false witnesses and was consequently beheaded but they had only accomplished half of what they wanted by some means fair or foul suspicion had been sufficiently diverted from the true assassins but alfonso was not dead and thanks to the strength of his constitution and the skill of his doctors who had taken the lamentations of the pope and caesar quite seriously and thought to please them by curing alexander's son-in-law the wounded man was making progress towards convalescence news arrived at the same time that lucrezia had heard of her husband's accident and was starting to come and nurse him herself there was no time to lose and caesar summoned michelotto the same night says Bucardus, don alfonso who would not die of his wounds was found strangled in his bed the funeral took place the next day with a ceremony not unbecoming in itself though unsuited to his high rank don francesca bagia archbishop of cosenza acted as chief mourner at st peter's where the body was buried in the chapel of santa maria della febbre lucrezia arrived the same evening she knew her father and brother too well to be put on the wrong scent and although immediately after alfonso's death the duke of valentinois had arrested the doctors the surgeons and a poor deformed wretch who had been acting as valet she knew perfectly well from what quarter the blow had proceeded in fear therefore that the manifestation of a grief she felt at this time too well might alienate the confidence of her father and brother she retired to nepi with her whole household her whole court and more than six hundred cavaliers there to spend the period of her mourning this important family business was now settled and lucrezia was again a widow and in consequence ready to be utilized in the pope's new political machinations caesar only stayed at rome to receive the ambassadors from france and venice but as their arrival was somewhat delayed and considerable inroads had been made upon the pope's treasury by the recent festivities the creation of twelve new cardinals was arranged this scheme was to have two effects viz to bring six hundred thousand ducats into the pontifical chest each hat having been priced at fifty thousand ducats and to assure the pope of a constant majority in the sacred council end of section number twenty section twenty one of celebrated crimes volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 21. The Borgias, Chapter 11, Part 2. The ambassadors at last arrived. The first was Monsieur de Villeneuve, the same who had come before to see the Duke of Valentinois in the name of France. Just as he entered Rome, he met on the road a masked man who, without removing his domino, expressed the joy he felt at his arrival. This man was Caesar himself, who did not wish to be recognized, and who took his departure after a short conference without uncovering his face. Monsieur de Villeneuve then entered the city after him, and at the Porta del Popolo found the ambassadors of the various powers, and among them those of Spain and Naples, whose sovereigns were not yet, it is true, in declared hostility to france though there was already some coolness the last named fearing to compromise themselves merely said to their colleague of france by way of complimentary address sir you are welcome whereupon the master of the ceremonies surprised at the brevity of the greeting asked if they had nothing else to say when they replied that they had not Monsieur de Villeneuve turned his back upon them, remarking that those who had nothing to say required no answer. He then took his place between the Archbishop of Reggio, Governor of Rome, and the Archbishop of Ragusa, 
and made his way to the palace of the holy apostles which had been got ready for his reception some days later maria giorgi ambassador extraordinary of venice made his arrival he was commissioned not only to arrange the business on hand with the pope but also to convey to alexander and caesar the title of venetian nobles and to inform them that their names were inscribed in the golden book a favour that both of them had long coveted less for the empty honour's sake than for the new influence that this title might confer then the pope went on to bestow the twelve cardinals hats that had been sold the new princes of the church were don diego de medosta archbishop of seville jacques archbishop of oristani the pope's vicar-general thomas archbishop of strigania piero archbishop of reggio governor of rome francesco Baggia, archbishop of cosenza treasurer-general gian archbishop of salerno vice-chamberlain luigi Baggia, archbishop of valencia secretary to his holiness and brother of the gian Borgia whom caesar had poisoned antonio bishop of coma gian battista ferraro bishop of medena amade de albre son of the king of navarre brother-in-law of the duke of valentinois and marco cornaro a venetian noble in whose person his holiness rendered back to the most serene republic the favour he had just received then as there was nothing further to detain the duke of valentinois at rome he only waited to effect a loan from a rich banker named agostino chigi brother of the lorenzo chigi who had perished on the day when the pope had been nearly killed by the fall of a chimney and departed for the romagna accompanied by vitellozzo vitelli gian paolo baglioni and jacopo di santa croce at the time his friends but later on his victims his first enterprise was against pesaro this was the polite attention of a brother-in-law and gian sforza very well knew what would be its consequences for instead of attempting to defend his possessions by taking up arms or venture on negotiations unwilling moreover to expose the fair lands he had ruled so long to the vengeance of an irritated foe he begged his subjects to preserve their former affection towards himself in the hope of better days to come and he fled into dalmatia malatesta lord of rimini followed his example thus the duke of valentinois entered both these towns without striking a single blow caesar left a sufficient garrison behind him and marched on to faenza but there the face of things was changed faenza at that time was under the rule of astor manfredi a brave and handsome young man of eighteen who relying on the love of his subjects towards his family had resolved on defending himself to the uttermost although he had been forsaken by the bentivalli his near relatives and by his allies the venetian and florentines who had not dared to send him any aid because of the affection felt towards caesar by the king of france accordingly when he perceived that the duke of valentinois was marching against him he assembled in hot haste all those of his vassals who were capable of bearing arms together with the few foreign soldiers who were willing to come into his pay and collecting victual and ammunition he took up his position with them inside the town by these defensive preparations caesar was not greatly disconcerted he commanded a magnificent army composed of the finest troops of france and italy led by such men as paolo and giulio orsini vitellozzo vitelli and paolo baglione not to speak of himself that is to say by the first captains of the period so after he had reconnoitred he at once began the siege pitching his camp between the two rivers amana and marziano placing his artillery on the side which faces on forli at which point the besieged army had erected a powerful bastion at the end of a few days busy with entrenchments the breach became practicable and the duke of valentinois ordered an assault and gave the example to his soldiers by being the first to march against the enemy but in spite of his courage and that of his captains beside him astor manfredi made so good a defence that the besiegers were repulsed with great loss of men while one of their bravest leaders honario savella was left behind in the trenches but faenza in spite of the courage and devotion of her defenders could not have held out long against so formidable an army had not winter come to her aid surprised by the rigour of the season with no houses for protection and no trees for fuel as the peasants had destroyed both beforehand the duke of valentinois was forced to raise the siege and take up his winter quarters in the neighbouring towns in order to be quite ready for a return next spring 
for caesar could not forgive the insult of being held in check by a little town which had enjoyed a long time of peace was governed by a mere boy and deprived of all outside aid and had sworn to take his revenge he therefore broke up his army into three sections sent one third to imola the second to forli and himself took the third to sassena a third-rate town which was thus suddenly transformed into a city of pleasure and luxury indeed for caesar's active spirit there must needs be no cessation of warfare or festivities so when war was interrupted fates began as magnificent and as exciting as he knew how to make them the days were passed in games or in displays of horsemanship the knights in dancing and gallantry for the loveliest woman of the romagna that is to say of the whole world had come hither to make a seraglio for the victor which might have been envied by the sultan of egypt or the emperor of constantinople while the duke of valentinois was making one of his excursions in the neighbourhood of the town with his retinue of flattering nobles and titled courtesans who were always about him he noticed a cortege on the rimini road so numerous that it must surely indicate the approach of someone of importance caesar soon perceiving that the principal person was a woman approached and recognised the very same lady-in-waiting to the duchess of urbino who on the day of the bullfight had screamed when caesar was all but touched by the infuriated beast at this time she was betrothed as we mentioned to gian caracciola general of the venetians elizabeth of gonzaga her protectress and grandmother was now sending her with a suitable retinue to venice where the marriage was to take place caesar had already been struck by the beauty of this young girl when at rome but when he saw her again she appeared more lovely than on the first occasion so he resolved on the instant that he would keep this fair flower of love for himself having often before reproached himself for his indifference in passing her by therefore he saluted her as an old acquaintance inquired whether she was staying any time at sassena and ascertained that she was only passing through travelling by long stages as she was awaited with much impatience and that she would spend the coming night at forli this was all that caesar cared to know he summoned michelotto and in a low voice said a few words to him which were heard by no one else the cortege only made a halt at the neighbouring town as the fair bride had said and started at once for forley although the day was already far advanced but scarcely had a league been covered when a troop of horsemen from sassena overtook and surrounded them although the soldiers in the escort were far from being in sufficient force they were eager to defend their general's bride but soon some fell dead and others terrified took to plight and when the lady came down from her litter to try to escape the chief seized her in his arms and set her in front of him on his horse then ordering his men to return to sassena without him he put his horse to the gallop in a cross direction and as the shades of evening were now beginning to fall he soon disappeared into the darkness caracciolo learned the news through one of the fugitives who declared that he had recognized among the ravishers the duke of valentinois soldiers at first he thought his ears had deceived him so hard was it to believe this terrible intelligence but it was repeated and he stood for one instant motionless and as it were thunderstruck then suddenly with a cry of vengeance he threw off his stupor and dashed away to the ducal palace where sat the doge barberigo and the council of ten unannounced he rushed into their midst the very moment after they had heard of caesar's outrage most serene lords he cried i am come to bid you farewell for i am resolved to sacrifice my life to my private vengeance though indeed i had hoped to devote it to the service of the republic i have been wounded in the soul's noblest part in my honour the dearest thing i possessed my wife has been stolen from me and the thief is the most treacherous the most impious the most infamous of men it is valentinois my lords i beg you will not be offended if i speak thus of a man whose boast it is to be a member of your noble ranks and to enjoy your protection it is not so he lies and his loose and criminal life has made him unworthy of such honours even as he is unworthy of the life whereof my sword shall deprive him in truth his very birth was a sacrilege he is a fratricide a usurper of the goods of other men an oppressor of the innocent and a highway assassin he is a man who will violate every law even the law of hospitality respected by the veriest barbarian a man who will do violence to a virgin who is passing through his own country 
where she had every right to expect from him not only the consideration due to her sex and condition but also that which is due to the most serene republic whose condottieri i am and which is insulted in my person and in the dishonouring of my bride this man i say merits indeed to die by another hand than mine yet since he who ought to punish him is not for him a prince and judge but only a father quite as guilty as the son i myself will seek him out and i will sacrifice my own life not only in avenging my own injury and the blood of so many innocent beings but also in promoting the welfare of the most serene republic on which it is his ambition to trample when he has accomplished the ruin of the other princes of italy the doge and the senators who as we said were already apprised of the event that had brought caracciolo before them listened with great interest and profound indignation for they as he told them were themselves insulted in the person of their general they all swore on their honour that if he would put the matter in their hands and not yield to his rage which could only work his own undoing either his bride should be rendered up to him without a smirch upon her bridal veil or else a punishment should be dealt out proportioned to the affront and without delay as a proof of the energy wherewith the noble tribunal would take action in the affair luigi manetti secretary to the ten was sent to imola where the duke was reported to be that he might explain to him the great displeasure with which the most serene republic viewed the outrage perpetrated upon the condottiere at the same time the council of ten and the doge sought out the french ambassador entreating him to join with them and repair in person with menenti to the duke of valentinois and summon him in the name of king louis the twelfth immediately to send back to venice the lady he had carried off the two messengers arrived at imola where they found caesar who listened to their complaint with every mark of utter astonishment denying that he had been in any way connected with the crime nay authorising menenti and the french ambassador to pursue the culprits and promising that he would himself have the most active search carried on the duke appeared to act in such complete good faith that the envoys were for the moment hoodwinked and themselves undertook a search of the most careful nature they accordingly repaired to the exact spot and began to procure information on the high road there had been found dead and wounded a man had been seen going by at a gallop carrying a woman in distress on his saddle he had soon left the beaten track and plunged across country a peasant coming home from working in the fields had seen him appear and vanish again like a shadow taking the direction of a lonely house an old woman declared that she had seen him go into this house but the next night the house was gone as though by enchantment and the ploughshare had passed over where it stood so that none could say what had become of her whom they sought for those who had dwelt in the house and even the house itself were there no longer menenti and the french ambassador returned to venice and related what the duke had said what they had done and how all search had been in vain no one doubted that caesar was the culprit but none could prove it so the most serene republic which could not considering their war with the turks be embroiled with the pope forbade caracciola to take any sort of private vengeance and so the talk grew gradually less and at last the occurrence was no more mentioned but the pleasures of the winter had not diverted caesar's mind from his plans about faenza scarcely did the spring season allow him to go into the country than he marched anew upon the town camped opposite the castle and making a new breach ordered a general assault himself going up first of all but in spite of the courage he personally displayed and the able seconding of his soldiers they were repulsed by astor who at the head of his men defended the breach while even the women at the top of the rampart rolled down stones and trunks of trees upon the besiegers after an hour's struggle man to man caesar was forced to retire leaving two thousand men in the trenches about the town and among the two thousand one of his bravest condottieri valentino farnese then seeing that neither excommunications nor assaults could help him caesar converted the siege into a blockade all the roads leading to faenza were cut off all communications stopped and further as various signs of revolt had been remarked at Cesena, a governor was installed there whose powerful will was well known to caesar ramiro d'orco with powers of life and death over the inhabitants he then waited quietly before faenza till hunger should drive out the citizens from those walls they defended with such vehement enthusiasm at the end of a month during which the people of faenza had suffered all the horrors of famine 
delegates came out to parley with Caesar with a view to capitulation. Caesar, who still had plenty to do in the Romagna, was less hard to satisfy than might have been expected, and the town yielded on condition that he should not touch either the persons or the belongings of the inhabitants. That Alstor Manfredi, the youthful ruler, should have the privilege of retiring whenever he pleased, and should enjoy the revenue of his patrimony wherever he might be. The conditions were faithfully kept so far as the inhabitants were concerned, but Caesar, when he had seen Astor, whom he did not know before, was seized by a strange passion for this beautiful youth, who was like a woman. He kept him by his side in his own army, showing him honours befitting a young prince, and evincing before the eyes of all the strongest affection for him. One day Astor disappeared, just as Caracciolo's bride had disappeared, and no one knew what had become of him. Caesar himself appeared very uneasy, saying that he had no doubt made his escape somewhere, and in order to give credence to this story, he sent out couriers to seek him in all directions. A year after this double disappearance, there was picked up in the Tiber, a little below the castle Sant'Angelo, the body of a beautiful woman, her hands bound together behind her back, and also the corpse of a handsome youth, with the bowstring he had been strangled with tied around his neck. The girl was Caracciolo's bride, the young man was Asta. During the last year both had been the slaves of Caesar's pleasures. Now tired of them, he had had them thrown into the Tiber. The capture of Faenza had brought to Caesar the title of Duke of Romagna, which was first bestowed on him by the Pope in full consistory, and afterwards ratified by the King of Hungary, the Republic of Venice, and the Kings of Castile and Portugal. The news of the ratification arrived at Rome on the eve of the day on which the people are accustomed to keep the anniversary of the foundation of the Eternal City. This fate, which went back to the days of Pomponius Laetus, acquired a new splendour in their eyes from the joyful events that had just happened to their sovereign. As a sign of joy, cannon were fired all day long. In the evening there were illuminations and bonfires, and during part of the night the Prince of Squillace, with the chief lords of the Roman nobility, marched about the streets, bearing torches and exclaiming, Long live Alexander! Long live Caesar! Long live the Borgias! Long live the Orsini! Long live the Duke of Romagna! End of section 21Section 22 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Maxson. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G.B. Ives, Section 22, The Borgias. Chapter 12. Caesar's ambition was only fed by victories. Scarcely was he master of Faenza before, excited by the Marascotti, old enemies of the Bentivoglio family, he cast his eyes upon Bologna. But John de Bentivoglio, whose ancestors had possessed this town from time immemorial, had not only made all preparations necessary for a long resistance, but he had also put himself under the protection of France. So scarcely had he learned that Caesar was crossing the frontier of the Bolognese territory with his army, than he sent a courier to Louis Twelfth to claim the fulfillment of his promise. Louis kept it with his accustomed good faith, and when Caesar arrived before Bologna, he received an intimation from the King of France that he was not to enter on any undertaking against his ally Bentivoglio. Caesar, not being the man to have his plans upset for nothing, made conditions for his retreat, to which Bentivoglio consented, only too happy to be quit of him at this price. The conditions were the cession of Castello Bolognese, a fortress between Imola and Faenza, the payment of a tribute of nine thousand ducats, and the keeping for his service of a hundred men-at-arms and two thousand infantry. In exchange for these favors, Caesar confided to Bentivoglio that his visit had been due to the councils of the Marascotti. Then, reinforced by his new allies contingent, he took the road for Tuscany. But he was scarcely out of sight when Bentivoglio shut the gates of Bologna, and commended his son Hermes to assassinate with his own hand Agamemnon Marascotti, the head of the family, and ordered the massacre of four-and-thirty of his near relatives, brothers, sons, daughters, and nephews, and two hundred other of his kindred and friends. The butchery was carried out by the noblest youths of Bologna, whom Bentivoglio forced to bathe their hands in this blood, so that he might attach them to himself 
through their fear of reprisals. Caesar's plans with regard to Florence were now no longer a mystery. Since the month of January, he had sent to Pisa for ten or twelve hundred men under the command of Reniero della Sasseta and Piero da Gamba Corti, and as soon as the conquest of the Romagna was complete, he had further dispatched Oliverotto di Fermo with new detachments. His own army had he reinforced, as we have seen, by a hundred men-at-arms and two thousand infantry. He had just been joined by Vitellozzo Vitelli, lord of Citta di Castello, and by the Orsini, who had brought him another two or three thousand men. So without counting the troops sent to Pisa, he had under his control seven hundred men-at-arms and five thousand infantry. Still, in spite of this formidable company, he entered Tuscany, declaring that his intentions were only pacific, protesting that he only desired to pass through the territories of the Republic on his way to Rome, and offering to pay in ready money for any victual his army might require. But when he had passed the defiles of the mountains, and arrived at Barbarino, feeling that the town was in his power, and nothing could now hinder his approach, he began to put a price on the friendship he had at first offered freely, and to impose his own conditions, instead of accepting those of others. These were that Piero de' Medici, kinsman and ally of the Orsini, should be reinstated in his ancient power, that six Florentine citizens, to be chosen by Vitellozzo, should be put into his hands, that they might by their death expiate that of Paolo Vitelli, unjustly executed by the Florentines, that the Signoria should engage to give no aid to the Lord of Piombino, whom Caesar intended to dispossess of his estates without delay, and further, that he himself should be taken into the service of the Republic, for a pay proportionate to his deserts. But just as Caesar had reached this point in his negotiations with Florence, he received orders from Louis the Twelfth to get ready, so soon as he conveniently could, to follow him with his army, and to help in the conquest of Naples, which he was at last in a position to undertake. Caesar dared not break his word to so powerful an ally. He therefore replied that he was at the king's orders, and as the Florentines were not aware that he was acquitting them on compulsion, he sold his retreat for the sum of thirty-six thousand ducats per annum, in exchange for which sum he was to hold three hundred men-at-arms, always in readiness, to go to the aid of the Republic at her earliest call, and in any circumstances of need. But hurried as he was, Caesar still hoped that he might find time to conquer the territory of Piombino as he went by, and take the capital by a single vigorous stroke. So he made his entry into the lands of Jacopo IV of Appiano. The latter, he found, however, had been beforehand with him, and, to rob him of all resource, had laid waste in his own country, burned his fodder, felled his trees, torn down his vines, and destroyed a few fountains that produced salubrious waters. This did not hinder Caesar from seizing in the space of a few days Severeto, Scarlino, the Isle of Elba, and La Pianosa, but he was obliged to stop short at the castle, which opposed a serious resistance. As Louis XII's army was continuing its way towards Rome, and he received a fresh order to join it, he took his departure the next day, leaving behind him Vitellozzo and Gianpaolo Bagliani to prosecute the siege in his absence. Louis XII was this time advancing upon Naples, not with the incautious ardor of Charles the Eighth, but, on the contrary, with that prudence and circumspection which characterized him. Besides his alliance with Florence and Rome, he had also signed a secret treaty with Ferdinand the Catholic, who had similar pretensions, through the house of Duras, to the throne of Naples, to those Louis himself had through the house of Anjou. By this treaty the two kings were sharing their conquests beforehand. Louis would be the master of Naples, of the town of Lavore and the Abruzzi, and would bear the title of King of Naples and Jerusalem. Ferdinand reserved for his own share the Apulia and Calabria, with the title of Duke of these provinces. Both were to receive the investiture from the Pope, and to hold them of him. This partition was all the more likely to be made, in fact, because Frederick, supposing all the time that Ferdinand was his good and faithful friend, would open the gates of his towns, only to receive into his fortresses conquerors and masters, instead of allies. All this perhaps was not very loyal conduct on the part of a king who had so long desired, and had just now received the surname of Catholic, but it mattered little to Louis, who profited by treasonable acts he did not have to share. The French army, which the Duke of Valentinois had just joined, consisted of one thousand lances, four thousand Swiss, and six thousand Gascons and adventurers. Further, Philip of Rabenstein was bringing by sea six Breton and Provençal vessels, 
and three Genoese carracks, carrying 6,500 invaders. Against this mighty host, the King of Naples had only 700 men-at-arms, 600 light horse, and 6,000 infantry under the command of the Colonna, whom he had taken into his pay after they were exiled by the Pope from the states of the Church. But he was counting on Gonsalvo of Cordova, who was to join him at Gaeta, and to whom he had confidingly opened all his fortresses in Calabria. But the feeling of safety inspired by Frederick's faithless ally was not destined to endure long. On their arrival at Rome, the French and Spanish ambassadors presented to the Pope the treaty signed at Grenada on the 11th of November, 1500, between Louis the Twelfth and Ferdinand the Catholic, a treaty which up to that time had been secret. Alexander, foreseeing the probable future had, by the death of Alfonso, loosened all the bonds that attached him to the House of Aragon, and then began by making some difficulty about it. It was demonstrated that the arrangement had only been undertaken to provide the Christian princes with another weapon for attacking the Ottoman Empire, and before this consideration, one may readily suppose, all the Pope's scruples vanished. On the 25th of June, therefore, it was decided to call a consistory which was to declare Frederick deposed from the throne of Naples. When Frederick had heard all at once that the French army had arrived at Rome, that his ally Ferdinand had deceived him, and that Alexander had pronounced the sentence of his downfall, he understood that all was lost. But he did not wish it to be said that he had abandoned his kingdom without even attempting to save it. So he charged his two new condottieri, Fabrizio Colonna and Manuzia di Marciano, to check the French before Capua with three hundred men-at-arms, some light horse, and three thousand infantry. In person he occupied a versa with another division of his army, while Prospero Colonna was sent to defend Naples with the rest, and make a stand against the Spaniards on the side of Calabria. These dispositions were scarcely made when D'Aubigny, having passed the Volturno, approached to lay siege to Capua, and invested the town on both sides of the river. Scarcely were the French encamped before the ramparts, that they began to set up their batteries, which were soon in play, much to the terror of the besieged, who, poor creatures, were almost strangers to the town, and had fled thither from every side, expecting to find protection beneath the walls. So although bravely repulsed by Fabrizio Colonna, the French, from the moment of their first assault, inspired so great and blind a terror that every one began to talk of opening the gates, and it was only with great difficulty that Colonna made this multitude understand that at least they ought to reap some benefit from the check the besiegers had received, and obtained good turns of capitulation. When he had brought them round to his view, he sent out to demand a parley with D'Aubigny, and a conference was fixed for the next day but one in which they were to treat of the surrender of the town. But this was not Caesar Borgia's idea at all. He had stayed behind to confer with the Pope, and had joined the French army with some of his troops on the very day on which the conference had been arranged for two days later, and a capitulation of any nature would rob him of his share of the booty and the promise of such pleasure as would come from the capture of a city so rich and populous as Capua. So he opened up negotiations on his own account, with a captain who was on guard at one of the gates. Such negotiations, made with cunning supported by bribery, proved as usual more prompt and efficacious than any others. At the very moment when Fabrizio Colonna, in a fortified outpost, was discussing the conditions of capitulation with the French captains, suddenly great cries of distress were heard. These were caused by Borgia, who without a word to any one had entered the town with his faithful army from Romagna, and was being, beginning to cut the throats of the garrison, which had naturally somewhat relaxed their vigilance in the belief that the capitulation was all but signed. The French, when they saw that the town was half taken, rushed on the gates with such impetuosity that the besieged did not even attempt to defend themselves any longer, and forced their way into Capua by three separate sides. Nothing more could be done then to stop the issue. Butchery and pillage had begun, and the work of destruction must needs be completed. In vain did Fabrizio Colonna, Ranuzio di Marziano, and Don Ugo di Cordona attempt to make head against the French and Spaniards with such men as they could get together. Fabrizio Colonna and Don Ugo were made prisoners. Ranuzio, wounded by an arrow, fell into the hands of the Duke of Valentinois. Seven thousand inhabitants were massacred in the streets, among them the traitor who had given up the gate. The churches were pillaged, the convents of nuns forced open, and then might be seen the spectacle of some of these holy virgins casting themselves into pits or into the river to escape the soldiers. Three hundred of the noblest ladies of the town took refuge in a tower. 
the Duke of Valentinois, broke in the doors, chased out for himself forty of the most beautiful, and handed over the rest to his army. The pillage continued for three days. Capua once taken, Frederick saw that it was useless any longer to attempt defense, so he shut himself up in Castel Nuovo, and gave permission to Gaeta and to Naples to treat with the conqueror. Gaeta brought him immunity from pillage with sixty thousand ducats, and Naples with the surrender of the castle. This surrender was made to Daubigny by Frederick himself, a condition that he should be allowed to take the island of Ischia, his money, jewels, and furniture, and there remain with his family for six months secure from all hostile attack. The terms of this capitulation were faithfully adhered to on both sides. Daubigny entered Naples, and Frederick retired to Ischia. Thus, by a last terrible blow, never to rise again, fell this branch of the House of Aragon, which had now reigned for sixty-five years. Frederick, its head, demanded and obtained a safe conduct to pass into France, where Louis the Twelfth gave him the Duchy of Anjou and thirty thousand ducats a year, in condition that he should never quit the kingdom. And there, in fact, he died, on the ninth of September, 1504. His eldest son, Dan Ferdinand, Duke of Calabria, retired to Spain, where he was permitted to marry twice, but each time with a woman who was known to be barren, and there he died in 1550. Alfonso, the second son, who had followed his father to France, died, it is said, of poison at Grenoble, at the age of twenty-two. Lastly, Caesar, the third song, died at Ferrara, before he had attained his eighteenth birthday. Frederick's daughter Charlotte married in France, Nicholas, Count of Laval, governor and admiral of Brittany, a daughter was born of this marriage, Anne de Laval, who married Francois de la Trimaux. Through her, those rights were transferred to the house of la Trimaux, which were used later as a claim upon the kingdom of the two Sicilies. The capture of Naples gave the Duke of Valentinois his liberty again, so he left the French army after he had received fresh assurances on his own account of the king's friendliness, and returned to the siege of Piombino, which he had been forced to interrupt. During this interval, Alexander had been visiting the scenes of his son's conquests, and traversing all the Romagna with Lucrezia, who was now consoled for her cousin's death, and had never before enjoyed such favor with his holiness. So, when she returned to Rome, she no longer had separate rooms from him. The result of this recrudescence of affection was the appearance of two pontifical bulls, converting the towns of Nepi and Sermonetta into duchies. One was bestowed on John Bargia, an illegitimate child of the Pope, who was not the son of either of his mistresses, Rosa Venoza or Giulia Varnese, the other, and Don Roderico of Aragon, son of Lucrezia and Alfonso. The lands of the Colonna were an appendage to the two duchies. But Alexander was dreaming of yet another addition to his fortune. This was to come from a marriage between Lucrezia and Don Alfonso d'Este, son of Duke Hercules of Ferrara, in favor of which alliance Louis the Twelfth had negotiated. His Holiness was now having a run of good fortune, and he learned on the same day that Piombino was taken, and that Duke Hercules had given the King of France his assent to the marriage. Both of these pieces of news were good for Alexander, but the one could not compare in importance with the other. In the intimation that Lucrezia was to marry the heir presumptive to the Duchy of Ferrara, was received with a joy so great that it smacked of the humble beginnings of the Borgian house. The Duke of Valentinois was invited to return to Rome, to take his share in the family rejoicing, and on the day when the news was made public, the governor of Sant'Angelo received orders that cannon should be fired every quarter of an hour from noon to midnight. At two o'clock, Lucicia, attired as a fiancé, and accompanied by her two brothers, the Dukes of Valentinois and Squilace, issued from the Vatican followed by all the nobility of Rome, and proceeded to the church of the Madonna del Popolo, where the Duke of Gandia and Cardinal John Borgia were buried, to render thanks for this new favor accorded to their house by God. And in the evening, accompanied by the same cavalcade, which shone the more brightly under the torchlight and brilliant illuminations, she made procession through the whale town, greeted by cries of, Long live Pope Alexander the Sixth! Long live the Duchess of Ferrara! which were shouted aloud by heralds clad in cloth of gold. The next day an announcement was made in the town that a race course for the women was opened between the castle of Sant'Angelo and the Piazza of St. Peter's, 
that on every third day there would be a bullfight in the Spanish fashion, and that from the end of the present month, which was October, until the first day of Lent, masquerades would be permitted in the streets of Rome. Such was the nature of the fetes outside. The program of those going on within the Vatican was not presented to the people. For by the account of Bucciardo, an eyewitness, this is what happened. On the last Sunday of the month of October, fifty courtesans supped in the Apostolic Palace in the Duke of Valentinois' rooms, and after supper danced with the equerries and servants, first wearing their usual garments, afterwards in dazzling draperies. When supper was over, the table was removed, candlesticks were set on the floor in a symmetrical pattern, and a great quantity of chestnuts was scattered on the ground. These the fifty women skillfully picked up, running about gracefully in and about between the burning lights. The Pope, the Duke of Valentinois, and his sister Lucrezia, who were looking on at this spectacle from a gallery, encouraged the most agile and industrious with their applause, and they received prizes of embroidered garters, velvet boots, golden caps, and laces. Then new diversions took the place of these. We humbly ask forgiveness of our readers, and especially of our lady readers, but though we have found words to describe the first part of the spectacle, we have sought them in vain for the second. Suffice it to say, that just as there had been prizes for feats of adroitness, others were given now to the dancers who were most daring and brazen. Some days after this strange night, which calls to mind the Roman evenings in the days of Tiberius, Nero, and Heliogabalus, Lucretia, clad in a robe of golden brocade, her train carried by young girls dressed in white and crowned with roses, issued from her palace to the sound of trumpets and clarions, and made her way over carpets that were laid down in the streets through which she had to pass. Accompanied by the noblest cavaliers and the loveliest women in Rome, she betook herself to the Vatican, where in the Pauline Hall the Pope waited her. With the Duke of Valentinois, Don Ferdinand acting as proxy for the Duke Alfonso, and his cousin, Cardinal d'Este. The Pope sat on one side of the table, while the envoys from Ferrara stood on the other. In their midst came Lucrezia, and Don Ferdinand placed on her finger the nuptial ring. This ceremony over, Cardinal d'Este approached and presented to the bride four magnificent rings set with precious stones. Then a casket was placed on the table, richly inlaid with ivory, whence the cardinal drew forth a great many trinkets, chains, necklaces of pearls, and diamonds, of workmanship as costly as their material. These he also begged Lucrezia to accept, before she received those the bridegroom was hoping to offer himself, which would be more worthy of her. Lucrezia showed the utmost delight in accepting these gifts. Then she retired into the next room, leaning on the Pope's arm, and followed by the ladies of her suite, leaving the Duke of Valentinois to do the honors of the Vatican to the men. That evening the guests met again, and spent half the night in dancing, while a magnificent display of fireworks lighted up the Piazza of San Paolo. The ceremony of betrothal over, the Pope and the Duke busied themselves with making preparations for the departure. The Pope, who wished the journey to be made with a great degree of splendor, sent in his daughter's company, in addition to the two brothers-in-law and gentlemen in their suite, the Senate of Rome and all the lords who, by virtue of their wealth, could display most magnificence in their costumes and liveries. Among this brilliant throng might be seen Olivero and Ramiro Mattei, sons of Piero Mattei, chancellor of the town and a daughter of the Pope whose mother was not Rosa Venozza. Besides these, the Pope nominated in consistory Francesco Borgia, Cardinal of the Sosenza, Legate alla Terre, to accompany his daughter to the frontiers of the ecclesiastical states. Also, the Duke of Valentinois sent out messengers into all the cities of Romagna to order that Lucrezia should be received as sovereign lady and mistress. Grand preparations were at once set on foot for the fulfillment of his orders. But the messengers reported that they greatly feared that there would be some grumbling at Cesena, where it will be remembered that Caesar had left Ramiro Dorco as governor, with plenary powers, to calm the agitation of the town. Now, Ramiro Dorco had accomplished his task so well that there was nothing more to fear in the way of rebellion, for one-sixth of the inhabitants had perished on the scaffold, and the result of this situation was that it was improbable that the same demonstrations of joy could be expected from a town plunged in mourning that were looked for from Imala, Faenza, and Pizarro. The Duke of Valentinois averted this inconvenience in the prompt and efficacious fashion characteristic of him alone. One morning the inhabitants of Cesena awoke to find a scaffold set up in the square, and upon it the four quarters of a man, his head severed from the trunk, 
stuck upon the end of a pike. This man was Ramiro Dorco. No one ever knew by whose hands the scaffold had been raised by night, nor by what executionals the terrible deed had been carried out. But when the Florentine Republic set to ask Machiavelli, their ambassador at Cesena, what he thought of it, he replied, Magnificent lords, I can tell you nothing concerning the execution of Ramiro Dorco, except that Caesar Borgia is the prince who best knows how to make and unmake men according to their deserts. Niccolo Machiavelli The Duke of Valentinois was not disappointed, and the future Duchess of Ferrara was admirably received in every town along her route, and particularly at Cesena. While Lucrezia was on her way to Ferrara to meet her fourth husband, Alexander, and the Duke of Valentinois, resolved to make progress in the region of their last conquest, the Duchy of Piombino. The apparent object of this journey was that the new subjects might take their oath to Caesar, and the real object was to form an arsenal in Jacopo da Piano's capital, within the reach of Tuscany, a plan which neither the Pope nor his son had ever seriously abandoned. The two accordingly started from the port of Corneto, with six ships, accompanied by a great number of cardinals and prelates, and arrived that same evening in Piombina. The pontifical court made a stay there of several days, partly with the view of making the duke known to the inhabitants, and also in order to be present at certain ecclesiastical functions, of which the most important was a service held on the third Sunday in Lent, in which the Cardinal of Cosenza sang a mass, and the Pope officiated in state with the duke and the cardinals. After these solemn functions, the customary pleasures followed, and the Pope summoned the prettiest girls of the country, and ordered them to dance their national dances before him. Following on these dances came feasts of unheard-of magnificence, during which the Pope in the sight of all men completely ignored Lent, and did not fast. The abject of all these fetes was to scatter abroad a great deal of money, and so to make the Duke of Valentinois popular, while poor Jacopo da Piano was forgotten. When they left Piombino, the Pope and his son visited the island of Elba, where they only stayed long enough to visit the old fortifications and issue ordered for the buildings of new ones. Then the illustrious travelers embarked upon their return journey to Rome, but scarcely had they put out to sea when weather became adverse, and the Pope not wishing to put in at Porto Ferrajo, they remained five days on board, though they had only two days' provisions. During the last three days the Pope lived on fried fish that were caught under great difficulties because of the heavy weather. At last they arrived in sight of Corneto, and there the Duke, who was not on the same vessel as the Pope, seeing that his ship could not get in, had a boat put out, and so was taken ashore. The Pope was obliged to continue on his way towards Pontecole, where at last he arrived, after encountering so violent a tempest that all who were with him were utterly subdued by either sickness or the terror of death. The Pope alone did not show one instant's fear, but remained on the bridge during the storm, sitting on his armchair, invoking the name of Jesus and making the sign of the cross. At last his ship entered the, the roads of Pontecole, where he landed, and after sending to Corneto to fetch horses, he rejoined the duke, who was there awaiting him. Then they returned by slow stages, by way of Civita Vecchia and Paolo, and reached Rome after an absence of a month. Almost at the same time, Dalbre arrived in quest of his cardinal's hat. He was accompanied by two princes of the House of Navarre, who were received not only with those honors which beseemed their rank, but also as brother-in-laws, to whom the duke was eager to show in what spirit he was contracting this alliance. End of section 22section 23 of celebrated crimes volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by morgan scorpion celebrated crimes volume 1 by alexander dumas translated by gb ives section 23 the borgias chapter 13 part 1 the time had now come for the Duke of Valentinois to continue the pursuit of his conquests. So, since on the 1st of May in the preceding year the Pope had pronounced sentence of forfeiture in full consistory against Julius Caesar of Verano, as punishment for the murder of his brother Rudolf for the harbouring of the Pope's enemies, 
and he had accordingly been mulcted of his fief of Camerino, which was to be handed over to the apostolic chamber. Caesar left Rome to put the sentence in execution. Consequently, when he arrived on the frontiers of Perugia, which belonged to his lieutenant, Gian Paolo Baglioni, he sent Oliverotto da Fermo and Orsini of Guarini to lay waste the march of Camerino, at the same time petitioning Guido Gilbaldo di Montefeltro, Duke of Urbino, to lend his soldiers and artillery to help him in this enterprise. The unlucky Duke of Urbino, who enjoyed the best possible relations with the Pope, and who had no reason for distrusting Caesar, did not dare refuse. But on the very same day that the Duke of Urbino's troops started for Camerino, Caesar's troops entered the Duchy of Urbino, and took possession of Caldi, one of the four towns of the little state. The Duke of Urbino knew what awaited him if he tried to resist, and fled incontinently, disguised as a peasant. Thus, in less than eight days, Caesar was master of his whole duchy, except the fortress of Maiolo and San Leone. The Duke of Valentinois forthwith returned to Camerino, where the inhabitants still held out, encouraged by the presence of Julius Caesar di Verano, their lord, and his two sons, Venantio and Hannibal. The eldest son, Gian Maria, had been sent by his father to Venice. The presence of Caesar was the occasion of parleying between the besiegers and besieged. A capitulation was arranged whereby Verano engaged to give up the town, on condition that he and his sons were allowed to retire safe and sound, taking with them their furniture, treasure, and carriages. But this was by no means Caesar's intention, so, profiting by the relaxation in vigilance that had naturally come about in the garrison when the news of the capitulation had been announced, he surprised the town in the night preceding the surrender, and seized Caesar de Verano and his two sons, who were strangled a short time after, the father at La Pergola and the sons at Pesaro, by Don Michel Corelio, who, though he had left the position of Spiro for that of a captain, every now and then returned to his first business. Meanwhile, Vitellozzo Vitelli, who had assumed the title of General of the Church, and had under him eight hundred men-at-arms and three thousand infantry, was following the secret instructions that he had received from Caesar by word of mouth, and was carrying forward that system of invasion which was to encircle Florence in a network of iron, and in the end make her defence an impossibility. A worthy pupil of his master, in whose school he had learned to use in turn the cunning of a fox and the strength of a lion, he had established an understanding between himself and certain young gentlemen of Arezzo to get that town delivered into his hands. But the plot had been discovered by Guglielmo del Pazzi, commissary of the Florentine Republic, and he had arrested two of the conspirators, whereupon the others, who were much more numerous than was supposed, had instantly dispersed about the town, summoning the citizens to arms. All the Republican faction, who saw in any sort of revolution the means of subjugating Florence, joined their party, set the captives at liberty, and seized Guglielmo. Then, proclaiming the establishment of the ancient constitution, they besieged the citadel, whither Cosimo de Pazzi, bishop of Arezzo, the son of Guglielmo, had fled for refuge. He, finding himself invested on every side, sent a messenger in hot haste to Florence to ask for help. Unfortunately for the cardinal, Vitellozzo's troops were nearer to the besiegers than were the soldiers of the most serene republic to the besieged, and instead of help, the whole army of the enemy came down upon him. This army was under the command of Vitellozzo, of Gianpaolo Baglioni, and of Fabio Orsino, and with them were the two Medici, ever ready to go wherever there was a league against Florence, and ever ready at the command of Borgia, on any conditions whatsoever, to re-enter the town whence they had been banished. The next day more help in the form of money and artillery arrived, sent by Pandolfo Petrucci, and on the 18th of June the citadel of Arezzo, which had received no news from Florence, was obliged to surrender. Vitellozzo left the men of Arezzo to look after their town themselves, leaving also Fabio Orsina to garrison the citadel with a thousand men. Then, profiting by the terror that had been spread throughout all this part of Italy, by the successive captures of the Duchy of Urbino, of Camerino, and of Arezzo, he marched upon Monte San Severino, Castiglione, Aretino, Cortoni, and the other towns of the valley of Chiana, which submitted one after the other almost without a struggle. 
when he was only ten or twelve leagues from Florence, and dared not, on his own account, tempt anything against her, he made known the state of affairs to the Duke of Valentinois. He, fancying the hour had come at last, for striking the blow so long delayed, started off at once to deliver his answer in person to his faithful lieutenants. But the Florentines, though they had sent no help to Guglielmo de Pazzi, had demanded aid from Charmont Dumbest, governor of the Milanese, on behalf of Louis the Twelfth, not only explaining the danger they themselves were in, but also Caesar's ambitious projects, namely, that after first overcoming the small principalities and then the states of the second order, he had now, it seemed, reached such a height of pride that he would attack the King of France himself. The news from Naples was disquieting. Serious differences had already occurred between the Count of Armagnac and Gonzalo di Cordova, and Louis might any day need Florence, whom he had always found loyal and faithful. He therefore resolved to check Caesar's progress, and not only sent him orders to advance no further, step forwards, but also sent off, to give in effect to his injunction, the Captain Imbo with four hundred lances. The Duke of Valentinois, on the frontier of Tuscany, received a copy of the treaty signed between the Republic and the King of France, a treaty in which the King engaged to help his ally against any enemy whatsoever, and at the same moment the formal prohibition from Louis to advance any further. Caesar also learned that beside the four hundred lances with the Captain Imbo, which were on the road to Florence, Louis the Twelfth had, as soon as he reached Asti, sent off to Parma Louis de la Tremue and two hundred men-at-arms, three thousand Swiss, and a considerable train of artillery. In these two movements combined, he saw hostile intentions toward himself, and, turning right about face with his usual agility, he profited by the fact that he had given nothing but verbal instructions to all his lieutenants, and wrote a furious letter to Vitalozzo, reproaching him for compromising his master, with a view to his own private interest, and ordering the instant surrender to the Florentines of the towns and fortresses he had taken, threatening to march down with his own troops and take them if he hesitated for a moment. As soon as this letter was written, Caesar departed for Milan, where Louis the Twelfth had just arrived, bringing with him proof positive that he had been calumniated in the evacuation of the conquered towns. He also was entrusted with the Pope's mission to renew for another eighteen months the title of legate a latere, in France to Cardinal Dumbest, the friend rather than the minister of Louis the Twelfth. Thus, thanks to the public proof of his innocence and private use of his influence, Caesar soon made his peace with the King of France. But this was not all. It was in the nature of Caesar's genius to divert an impending calamity that threatened his destruction so as to come out of it better than before, and he suddenly saw the advantage he might take from the pretended disobedience of his lieutenants. Already he had been disturbed now and again by their growing power, and coveted their towns. Now he thought the hour had perhaps come for suppressing them also, and in the usurpation of their private possessions striking a blow at Florence, who always escaped him at the very moment when he thought to take her. It was indeed an annoying thing to have these fortresses and towns displaying another banner than his own in the midst of the beautiful Romagna which he desired for his own kingdom. For Vitalozzo possessed Gitta di Castello, Bentivoglio Bologna, Gian Paolo Baglioni was in command of Perugia, Oliverotto had just taken Fermo, and Pandolfo Petrucci was lord of Siena. It was high time that all these were turned into his own hands. The lieutenants of the Duke of Valentinois, like Alexander's, were becoming too powerful, and Borgia must inherit from them, unless he were willing to let them become his own heirs. He obtained from Louis XII three hundred lances wherewith to march against them. As soon as Vitalozzo Vitelli received Caesar's letter, he perceived that he was being sacrificed to the fear that the King of France inspired. But he was not one of those victims who suffer their throats to be cut in the expiation of a mistake. He was a buffalo of Romagna, who opposed his horns to the knife of the butcher. Besides, he had the example of Verano and the Manfredi before him, and, death for death, he preferred to perish in arms. So Vitalozzo convoked at Magione all whose lives or lands were threatened by this new reversal of Caesar's policy. These were Paolo Orsino, Gian Paolo Baglioni, Hermes Bentivoglio, representing his father Gian, Antonio di Fanafro, 
the envoy of Pandolfo Petrucci, Oliver Toxo da Fermo, and the Duke of Urbino. The first six had everything to lose, and the last had already lost everything. A treaty of alliance was signed between the Confederates. They engaged to resist whether he attacked them severally or altogether. Caesar learned the existence of this league by its first effects. The Duke of Urbino, who was adored by his subjects, had come with a handful of soldiers to the fortress of San Leone, and it had yielded at once. In less than a week, towns and fortresses followed this example, and all the duchy was once more in the hands of the Duke of Urbino. At the same time, each member of the Confederacy openly proclaimed his revolt against the common enemy, and took up a hostile attitude. Caesar was at Imola, awaiting the French troops, but with scarcely any men, so that Bentivoglio, who held part of the country, and the Duke of Urbino, who had just reconquered the rest of it, could probably have either taken him or forced him to fly and quit the Romagna, had they marched against him, all the more since the two men on whom he counted, viz. Don Ugo di Cardona, who had entered his service after Capua was taken, and Michelotto, had mistaken his intention, and were all at once separated from him. He had really ordered them to fall back upon Rimini, and bring two hundred light horse and five hundred infantry, of which they had the command. But, unaware of the urgency of his situation, at the very moment when they were attempting to surprise La Pergola and Fossombrone, they were surrounded by Orsino of Gravina and Vitellozzo. Ugo di Cardona and Michelotto defended themselves like lions, but in spite of their utmost efforts their little band was cut to pieces, and Ugo di Cardona taken prisoner while Michelotto only escaped the same fate by lying down among the dead. When night came on, he escaped to Fano. But even alone as he was, almost without troops at Imola, the Confederates dared attempt nothing against Caesar, whether because of the personal fear he inspired, or because in him they respected the ally of the King of France. They contented themselves with taking the towns and fortresses in the neighbourhood. Vitellozzo had retaken the fortresses of Fossombrone, Urbino, Cali, and Agobbio. Orsino of Gravina had reconquered Fano and the whole province, while Gian Maria di Verano, the same who by his absence had escaped being massacred with the rest of his family, had re-entered Camerino, borne in triumph by his people. Not even all this could destroy Caesar's confidence in his own good fortune, and while he was on the one hand urging on the arrival of the French troops, and calling in to his prey all those gentlemen known as broken lances, because they went about the country in parties of five or six only, and attached themselves to anyone who wanted them, he had opened up negotiations with his enemies, certain that from that very day when he should persuade them to a conference they were undone. Indeed, Caesar had the power of persuasion as a gift from heaven, and though they perfectly well knew his duplicity, they had no power of resisting. Not so much of his actual eloquence, as that air of frank good nature which Machiavelli so greatly admired, and which indeed more than once deceived even him, wily politician as he was. In order to get Paolo Orsino to treat with him at Imola, Caesar sent Cardinal Borgia to the Confederates as a hostage, and on this Paolo Orsino hesitated no longer, and on the 25th of October, 1502, arrived at Imola. Caesar received him as an old friend, from whom one might have been estranged a few days, because of some slight passing differences. He frankly avowed that all the fault was no doubt on his side, since he had contrived to alienate men who were such loyal lords and also such brave captains. But with men of their nature, he added, an honest, honourable explanation such as he would give must put everything once more in statu quo. To prove that it was good will, not fear, that brought him back to them, he showed Orsino the letters from Cardinal Amboise, which announced the speedy arrival of French troops. He showed him those he had collected about him, in the wish, he declared, that they might be thoroughly convinced that what he chiefly regretted in the whole matter was not so much the loss of the distinguished captains who were the very soul of his vast enterprise, as that he had led the world to believe, in a way so fatal to his own interest, that he could for a single instant fail to recognise their merit, adding that he consequently relied upon him, Paolo Orsino, whom he had always cared for most, to bring back the Confederates by a peace which would be as much for the profit of all as a war was hurtful to all, and that he was ready to sign a treaty in consonance with their wishes so long as it should not prejudice his own honour. Orsino was the man Caesar wanted. 
full of pride and confidence in himself, he was convinced of the truth of the old proverb that says, A pope cannot reign eight days if he has half the Colonnas and the Orsini against him. He believed, therefore, if not in Caesar's good faith, at any rate in the necessity he must feel for making peace. Accordingly, he signed with him the following conventions, which only needed ratification on the 18th of October, 1502, which we reproduce here as Machiavelli sent them to the magnificent Republic of Florence. Agreement between the Duke of Valentinois and the Confederates Let it be known to the parties mentioned below, and to all who shall see these presents, that His Excellency the Duke of Romagna, of the one part, and the Orsini of the other part, together with their confederates, desiring to put an end to differences, enmities, misunderstandings, and suspicions which have arisen between them, have resolved as follows. There shall be between them peace and alliance, true and perpetual, with a complete obliteration of wrongs and injuries which may have taken place up to this day, both parties engaging to preserve no resentment of the same, and in conformity with the aforesaid peace and union, His Excellency, the Duke of Romagna, shall receive into perpetual confederation, league and alliance, all the lords aforesaid, and each of them shall promise to defend the estates of all in general, and of each in particular, against any power that may annoy or attack them for any cause whatsoever, excepting always, nevertheless, the Pope Alexander the Sixth, and His Very Christian Majesty, Louis the Twelfth, King of France." the lords above named promising on the other part to unite in the defence of the person and estates of his excellency and also those of the most illustrious lords don gafredo barger prince of squillas don rodrigo barger duke of sermeta and Biselli, and don gian borgia duke of camerino and negi all brothers or nephews of the duke of romagna moreover since the rebellion and usurpation of Urbino have occurred during the above-mentioned misunderstandings, all the confederates aforesaid, and each of them shall bind themselves to unite all their forces for the recovery of the estates aforesaid, and of such other places as have revolted and been usurped. His Excellency, the Duke of Romagna, shall undertake to continue to the Orsini and Vitelli their ancient engagements in the way of military service and on the same conditions. His Excellency promises further not to insist on the service in person of more than one of them, as they may choose. The service that the others may render shall be voluntary. He also promises that the second treaty shall be ratified by the Sovereign Pontiff, who shall not compel Cardinal Orsino to reside in Rome longer than shall seem convenient to this prelate. Furthermore, since there are certain differences between the Pope and the Lord Gian Benfivoglio, the Confederates aforesaid agree that they shall be put to the arbitration of Cardinal Orsino, of His Excellency the Duke of Romagna, and of the Lord Pandolfo Petrucci, without appeal. Thus the Confederates engage, each and all, so soon as they may be required by the Duke of Romagna, to put into his hands as a hostage one of the legitimate sons of each of them, in that place and at that time which he may be pleased to indicate. The same Confederates promising, moreover, all in each, that if any project directed against any one of them come to their knowledge to give warning thereof, and all to prevent such project reciprocally. It is agreed, over and above, between the Duke of Romagna and the Confederates aforesaid, to regard as a common enemy any who shall fail to keep the present stipulations, and to unite in the destruction of any states not conforming thereto. Signed, Caesar. Paolo Orsino, Agapit, Secretary. End of section number 23. Section 24 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 24. The Borgias, Chapter 13, Part 2. At the same time, while Orsino was carrying to the Confederates the treaty drawn up between him and the Duke, Bentivoglio, not willing to submit to the arbitration indicated, 
made an offer to Caesar of settling their differences by a private treaty, and sent his son to arrange the conditions after some parleying they were settled as follows. Bentivoglio should separate his fortunes from Vitelli and Orsini. He should furnish the Duke of Valentinois with a hundred men-at-arms and a hundred mounted archers for eight years. He should pay twelve thousand ducats per annum to Caesar for the support of a hundred lances. In return for this, his son Hannibal was to marry the sister of the Archbishop of Enna, who was Caesar's niece, and the Pope was to recognize his sovereignty in Bologna. The King of France, the Duke of Ferrara, and the Republic of Florence were to be the guarantors of this treaty. But the convention brought to the Confederates by Orsino was the cause of great difficulties on their part. Vitellozzo Vitelli, in particular, who knew Caesar the best, never ceased to tell the other condottieri that so prompt and easy a peace must needs be the cover to some trap. But since Caesar had meanwhile collected a considerable army at Imala, and the four hundred lances lent him by Louis the Twelfth had arrived at last, Vitellozzo and Oliverotto decided to sign the treaty that Orsino brought, and to let the Duke of Urbino and the Lord of Camerino know of it. They, seeing plainly that it was henceforth impossible to make a defence unaided, had retired, the one to Citta di Castello, and the other into the kingdom of Naples. But Caesar, saying nothing of his intentions, started on the 10th of December, and made his way to Cassena with a powerful army once more under his command. Fear began to spread on all sides, not only in Romagna, but in the whole of northern Italy. Florence, seeing him move away from her, only thought it a blind to conceal his intentions, while Venice, seeing him approach her frontiers, dispatched all her troops to the banks of the Po. Caesar perceived their fear, and lest harm should be done to himself by the mistrust it might inspire, he sent away all French troops in his service as soon as he reached Cassena, except a hundred men with Monsieur de Candale, his brother-in-law. It was then seen that he only had two thousand cavalry and two thousand infantry with him. Several days were spent in parleying, for at Cassena Caesar found the envoys of the Vitelli and Orsini, who themselves were with their army in the Duchy of Urbino. But after the preliminary discussions as to the right course to follow in carrying on the plan of conquest, there arose such difficulties between the general-in-chief and these agents, that they could not but see the impossibility of getting anything settled by intermediaries, and the urgent necessity of a conference between Caesar and one of the chiefs. So Oliverotto ran the risk of joining the Duke in order to make proposals to him, either to march on Tuscany or to take Sinigalia, which was the only place in the Duchy of Urbino that had not yet fallen into Caesar's power. Caesar's reply was that he did not desire to war upon Tuscany, because the Tuscans were his friends, but that he approved of the lieutenant's plans with regard to Sinigalia, and therefore was marching towards Fano. But the daughter of Frederick, the former Duke of Urbino, who held the town of Sinigalia, and who was called the Lady Prefect because she had married Gian della Rovere, whom his uncle Sixtus the Fourth had made Prefect of Rome, judging that it would be impossible to defend herself against the forces the Duke of Valentinois was bringing, left the citadel in the hands of a captain, recommending him to get the best terms he could for the town, and took boat for Venice. Caesar learned this news at Rimini through a messenger from Vitelli and the Orsino, who said that the governor of the citadel, though refusing to yield to them, was quite ready to make terms with him, and consequently they would engage to go to the town and finish the business there. Caesar's reply was that in consequence of this information he was sending some of his troops to Cassena and Imola, for they would be useless to him, as he should now have theirs, which together with the escort he retained would be sufficient, since his only object was the complete pacification of the Duchy of Urbino. He added that this pacification would not be possible if his old friends continued to distrust him, and to discuss through intermediaries alone plans in which their own fortunes were interested as well as his. The messenger returned with this answer, and the Confederates, though feeling, it is true, the justice of Caesar's remarks, none the less hesitated to comply with his demand. Vitellozzo Vitelli in particular showed a want of confidence in him, which nothing seemed able to subdue. But, pressed by Oliverotto, Guavina, and Orsino, he consented at last to await the Duke's coming, 
making concession rather because he could not bear to appear more timid than his companions than because of any confidence he felt in the return of friendship that Roger was displaying. The Duke learned the news of this decision, so much desired, when he arrived at Fano on the 20th of December, 1502. At once he summoned eight of his most faithful friends, amongst whom were Denna, his nephew Michelotto, and Ugo di Cordona, and ordered them, as soon as they arrived at Sinigalia, and had seen Vitalozzo, Gravina, Oliverata, and Gorsino come out to meet them, on a pretext of doing them honour, to place themselves on the right and left hand of the four generals. Two beside each, so that at a given signal they might either stab or arrest them. Next he assigned to each of them his particular man, bidding them not quit his side until he had re-entered Senegalia and arrived at the quarters prepared for him. Then he sent orders to such of the soldiers as were in cantonments in the neighbourhood to assemble the, to the number of eight thousand on the banks of the Metaurus, a little river of Umbria, which runs into the Adriatic and has been made famous by the defeat of Hannibal. The Duke arrived at the rendezvous given to his army on the 31st of December, and instantly sent out in front two hundred horse, and immediately behind them his infantry, following close in the midst of his men-at-arms following the coast of the Adriatic, with the mountains on his right, and the sea on his left, which in part of the way left only space for the army to march ten abreast. After four hours' march, the duke at a turn of the path, perceived Senegalia, nearly a mile distant from the sea, and a bowshot from the mountains. Between the army and the town ran a little river, whose banks he had to follow for some distance. At last he found a bridge opposite a suburb of the town, and here Caesar ordered his cavalry to stop. It was drawn up in two lines, one between the road and the river, the other on the side of the country, leaving the whole width of the road to the infantry, which latter defiled, crossed the bridge, and entering the town, drew themselves up in battle array in the great square. On their side, Vitalozzo, Gravina, Orsino, and Oliverotto, to make room for the Duke's army, had quartered their soldiers in little towns or villages in the neighbourhood of Senegalia. Oliverotto alone had kept nearly one thousand infantry and a hundred and fifty horse, who were in barracks in the suburbs through which the Duke entered. Caesar had made only a few steps towards the town when he perceived Vitalozzo at the gate, with the Duke of Gravina and Orsino, who all came out to meet him, the last two quite gay and confident but the first so gloomy and dejected, that you would have thought he foresaw the fate that was in store for him, and doubtless he had not been without the same presentiments. For when he left his army to come to Sinigalia, he had bidden them farewell as though never to meet again, had commended the care of his family to the captains, and embraced his children with tears, a weakness which appeared strange to all who knew him as a brave condottieri. The Duke marched up to them, holding out his hand, as a sign that all was over and forgotten, and did it with an air at once so loyal and so smiling that Gravina and Orsino could no longer doubt the genuine return of his friendship. And it was only Vitalozza still appeared sad. At the same moment, exactly as they had been commanded, the Duke's accomplices took their posts on the right and left of those they were to watch, who were all there except Oliverotto whom the duke could not see, and began to seek with uneasy looks. But as he crossed the suburb he perceived him exercising his troops on the square. Caesar at once dispatched Michelotto and Denna, with a message that it was a rash thing to have his troops out, when they might easily start some quarrel with the duke's men, and bring about an affray. It would be much better to settle them in barracks, and then come to join his companions, who were with Caesar. Oliverotto, drawn by the same fate as his friends, made no objection, ordered his soldiers indoors, and put his horse to the gallop to join the duke, escorted on either side by Denna and Michelotto. Caesar, on seeing him, called him, took him by the hand, and continued his march to the palace that had been prepared for him, his four victims following after. Arrived on the threshold, Caesar dismounted, and, signing to the leader of the men-at-arms to await his orders, he went in first, followed by Oliverotto, Gravina, Vitalozzo Vitelli and Orsino, each accompanied by his two satellites. But scarcely had they gone upstairs and into the first room when the door was shut behind them, and Caesar turned round, saying, The hour has come. 
This was the signal agreed upon. Instantly the former confederates were seized, thrown down, and forced to surrender with a dagger at their throat. Then, while they were being carried to a dungeon, Caesar opened the window, went out on the balcony, and cried out to the leader of his men-at-arms, "'Go forward!' The man was in the secret. He rushed on with his band towards the barracks where Oliver Rotter's soldiers had just been consigned, and they, suddenly surprised and off their guard, were at once made prisoners. Then the Duke's troops began to pillage the town, and he summoned Machiavelli. Caesar and the Florentine envoy were nearly two hours shut up together, and since Machiavelli himself recounts the history of this interview, we will give his own words. He summoned me, says the Florentine ambassador, and in the calmest manner showed me his joy at the success of this enterprise, which he assured me he had spoken of to me the evening before. I remember that he did, but I did not at that time understand what he meant. Next he explained, in terms of much feeling and lively affection for our city, the different motives which had made him desire your alliance, a desire to which he hopes you will respond. He ended with charging me to lay three proposals before your lordships, first that you rejoice with him in the destruction at a single blow of the mortal enemies of the king, himself, and you, and the consequent disappearance of all seeds of trouble and dissension likely to waste Italy. This service of his, together with his refusal to allow the prisoners to march against you, ought, he thinks, to excite your gratitude towards him. Secondly, he begs that you will at this juncture give him a striking proof of your friendliness, by urging your cavalry's advance towards Borgo, and there assembling some infantry also, in order that they may march with him should need arise, on Castello or on Perugia. Lastly, he desires, and this is his third condition, that you arrest the Duke of Urbino, if he should flee from Castello into your territories, when he learns that Vitellozzo is a prisoner. When I objected that to give him up would not beseem the dignity of the Republic, and that you would never consent, he approved of my words, and said that it would be enough for you to keep the Duke, and not give him his liberty without His Excellency's permission. I have promised to give you all this information, to which he awaits your reply. The same night eight masked men descended to the dungeon where the prisoners lay. They believed at that moment that the fatal hour had arrived for all. But this time the executioners had to do with Vitellozzo and Oliverotto alone. When these two captains heard that they were condemned, Oliverotto burst forth into reproaches against Vitellozzo, saying that it was all his fault that they had taken up arms against the Duke. Not a word Vitellozzo answered except a prayer that the Pope might grant him plenary indulgence for all his sins. Then the masked men took them away, leaving Orsino and Gravina to await a similar fate, and led away the two chosen out to die to a secluded spot outside the ramparts of the town, where they were strangled and buried at once in two trenches that had been dug beforehand. The two others were kept alive until it should be known if the Pope had arrested Cardinal Orsino, Archbishop of Florence and Lord of Santa Croce and when the answer was received in the affirmative from His Holiness, Gravina and Orsino, who had been transferred to a castle, were likewise strangled. The Duke, leaving instructions with Michelotto, set off for Sinigalia as soon as the first execution was over, assuring Machiavelli that he had never had any other thought than that of giving tranquillity to the Romagna and to Tuscany, and also that he thought he had succeeded by taking and putting to death the men who had been the cause of all the trouble. Also, that any other revolt that might take place in the future would be nothing but sparks that a drop of water could extinguish. The Pope had barely learned that Caesar had his enemies in his power when, eager to play the same winning game himself, he announced to Cardinal Orsino, though it was then midnight, that his son had taken Sinigalia, and gave him an invitation to come the next morning and talk over the good news. The Cardinal, delighted at this increase of favour, did not miss his appointment, so in the morning he started on horseback for the Vatican, but at a turn of the first street he met the governor of Rome with a detachment of cavalry, who congratulated him on the happy chance that they were taking the same road, and accompanied him to the threshold of the Vatican. There the cardinal dismounted and began to ascend the stairs. Scarcely, however, had he reached the first landing before his mules and carriages were seized and shut in the palace stables. When he entered the hall of the Peropont, he found that he and all his suite were surrounded by armed men, who led him into another apartment, called the Vicar's Hall, where he found the abbot Alviano, 
the proto-notary Orsino, Jacopo Santa Croce, and Rinaldo Orsino, who were all prisoners like himself. At the same time the governor received orders to seize the castle of Monte Giardino, which belonged to the Orsini, and take away all the jewels, all the hangings, all the furniture, and all the silver that he might find. The governor carried out his orders conscientiously, and brought to the Vatican everything he seized, down to the cardinal's account book. On consulting the book, the Pope found out two things. First, that a sum of two thousand ducats was due to the cardinal, no debtor's name being mentioned, Secondly, that the cardinal had bought three months before, for one thousand five hundred Roman crowns, a magnificent pearl which could not be found among the objects belonging to him, on which Alexander ordered that from that very moment until the negligence in the cardinal's account was repaired, the men who were in the habit of bringing him food twice a day on behalf of his mother should not be admitted into the castle St. Angelo. The same day the cardinal's mother sent the pope the two thousand ducats, and the next day his mistress, in man's attire, came in person to bring the missing pearl. His holiness, however, was so struck with her beauty in this costume that, we are told, he let her keep the pearl for the same price she had paid for it. Then the Pope allowed the Cardinal to have his food brought as before, and he died of poison on the 22nd of February, that is, two days after his accounts had been set right. The same night the Prince of Squillace set off to take possession, in the Pope's name, of the lands of the deceased. End of section 24。section 25 of celebrated crimes volume 1。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by Anne Boulay。Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexander Dumas, translated by G. B. Ives. Section 25, The Borgias, Chapter 14. The Duke of Valentinois had continued. His road towards Citta di Castello and Perugia, and had seized these two towns without striking a blow, for the Vitelli had fled from the former, and the latter had been abandoned by Gian Paolo Bagliano, with no attempt whatever at resistance. There still remained Siena, where Pandolfo Pedrucci was shut up, the only man remaining of all who had joined the league against Caesar. But Siena was under the protection of the French. Besides, Siena was not one of the states of the church, and Caesar had no rights there. Therefore he was content with insisting upon Pandolfo Petrucci's leaving the town and retiring to Lucca, which he accordingly did. Then all on this side being peaceful and the whole of Romagna in subjection, Caesar resolved to return to Rome and help the Pope to destroy all that was left of the Orsini. This was all the easier because Louis the Twelfth, having suffered reverses in the kingdom of Naples, had since then been much more concerned with his own affairs to disturb himself about his allies. So Caesar, doing for the neighborhood of the Holy See the same thing he had done for the Romagna, seized in succession Vicovario, Serra, Palumbura, Lanzano, and Cervetti, when these conquests were achieved, having nothing else to do now that he had brought the pontifical states into subjection from the frontiers of Naples to those of Venice, he returned to Rome to concert with his father as to the means of converting his duchy into a kingdom. Caesar arrived at the right moment to share with Alexander the property of Cardinal Gian Michel, who had just died, having received a poison cup from the hands of the Pope. The future king of Italy found his father preoccupied with a grand project. He had resolved, for the feast of St. Peter's, to create nine cardinals. What he had to gain from these nominations is as follows. First, the cardinals elected would leave all their offices vacant, these offices would fall into the hands of the Pope, and he would sell them. Secondly, each of them would buy his election, more or less dear according to his fortune. The price, left to be settled at the Pope's fancy, would vary from 10,000 to 40,000 ducats. Lastly, since as cardinals, they would by law lose the right of making a will, the Pope, in order to inherit from them, had only to poison them. This put him in the position of a butcher who, if he needs money, has only to cut the throat of the fattest sheep in the flock. The nomination came to pass. The new cardinals were Giovanni Castellaro Valentine, Archbishop of Trani, 
Francesco Ramolini, ambassador from the King of Aragon, Francesco Soldarini, Bishop of Volterra, Melchiori Copus, Bishop of Brissina, Nicholas Friesque, Bishop of Frejas, Francesco di Sprate, Bishop of Leome, Adriano Castellense, Clerk of the Chamber, Treasurer General, and Secretary of the Briefs, Francesco Boris, Bishop of Elva, Patriarch of Constantinople, and Secretary to the Pope, and Giancomo Casanova, Proto Notary and Private Chaplain to His Holiness. The price of their simony paid and their vacated offices sold. The Pope made his choice of those he was to poison. The number was fixed at three, one old and two new. The old one was Cardinal Casanova, and the new ones Melchior Copus and Adriano Castellense, who had taken the name of Adrian of Carnetta from that town where he had been born, and where, in the capacity of clerk of the chamber, treasurer general, and secretary of briefs, he had amassed an immense fortune. So when all was settled between Caesar and the Pope, they invited their chosen guests to supper in a vineyard situated near the Vatican, belonging to the Cardinal of Cornetto. In the morning of this day, the 2nd of August, they sent their servants and the steward to make all preparations, and Caesar himself gave the Pope's butlers two bottles of wine prepared with the white powder resembling sugar, whose mortal properties he had so often proved, and gave orders that he was to serve this wine only when he was told, and only to persons specially indicated. The butler accordingly put the wine in a sideboard apart, bidding the waiters on no account to touch it, as it was reserved for the Pope's drinking. The poison of the Borgias, say contemporary writers, was of two kinds, powder and liquid. The poison in the form of powder was a sort of white flour, almost impalpable, with the taste of sugar, and called contorella. Its composition is unknown. The liquid poison was prepared, we are told, in so strange a fashion that we cannot pass it by in silence. We repeat here what we read, and vouch for nothing ourselves, lest science should give us the lie. A strong dose of arsenic was administered to a boar. As soon as the poison began to take effect, he was hung up by his heels, convulsions supervened, and a froth deadly and abundant ran out from his jaws. It was this froth, collected in a silver vessel and transferred into a bottle hermetically sealed, that made the liquid poison. Towards evening, Alexander the Sixth walked from the Vatican leaning on Caesar's arm, and turned his steps toward the vineyard, accompanied by Cardinal Carafa. But as the heat was great and the climb rather steep, the Pope, when he reached the top, stopped to take breath. Then putting his hand on his breast, he found that he had left in his bedroom a chain he always wore round his neck, which suspended a gold medallion that enclosed the sacred host. He owed this habit to a prophecy that an astrologer had made, that so long as he carried about a sacred wafer, neither steel nor poison could take hold upon him. Now, finding himself without his talisman, he ordered Monsignor Carafa to hurry back at once to the Vatican, and told him in which part of his room he had left it, so that he might get it and bring it him without delay. Then, as the walk had made him thirsty, he turned to a valet, giving signs with his hand as he did so that his messenger should make haste, and asked for something to drink. Caesar, who was also thirsty, ordered the man to bring two glasses. By a curious coincidence, the butler had just gone back to the Vatican to fetch some magnificent peaches that had been sent that very day to the Pope but which had been forgotten when he came here. So the valet went to the under-butler, saying that His Holiness and Monsignor the Duke of Romagna were thirsty and asking for a drink. The under-butler, seeing two bottles of wine set apart, and having heard that this wine was reserved for the Pope, took one, and telling the valet to bring two glasses on a tray, poured out this wine, which both drank, little thinking that it was what they had themselves prepared to poison their guests. Meanwhile, Carafa hurried to the Vatican, and, as he knew the palace well, went up to the Pope's bedroom, a light in his hand, and attended by no servant. As he turned round a corridor, a puff of wind blew out his lamp. Still, as he knew the way, he went on, thinking there was no need of seeing to find the object he was in search of. But as he entered the room, he recoiled a step, with a cry of terror. 
he beheld a ghastly apparition it seemed that there before his eyes in the middle of the room between the door and the cabinet which held the medallion alexander the sixth motionless and livid was lying on a bier at whose four corners there burned four torches the cardinal stood still for a moment his eyes fixed and his hair standing on end without strength to move either backward or forward then thinking it was all a trick of fancy or an apparition of the devil's making he made the sign of the cross invoking god's holy name all instantly vanished torches bier and corpse and the seeming mortuary chamber was once more in darkness then cardinal carafa who has himself recorded this strange event and who was afterwards pope paul the fourth entered baldly and though an icy sweat ran down his brow he went straight to the cabinet and in the drawer indicated found the gold chain and the medallion took them and hastily went out to give them to the pope he found supper served the guests arrived and his holiness ready to take his place at table as soon as the cardinal was in sight his holiness who was very pale made one step towards him carafa doubled his pace and handed the medallion to him but as the pope stretched forth his arm to take it he fell back with a cry instantly followed by violent convulsions an instant later as he advanced to render his father assistance caesar was similarly seized the effect of the poison had been more rapid than usual for caesar had doubled the dose and there is little doubt that their heated condition increased its activity the two stricken men were carried side by side to the vatican where each was taken to his own rooms from that moment they never met again as soon as he reached his bed the pope was seized with a violent fever which did not give way to emetics or to bleeding almost immediately it became necessary to administer the last sacraments of the church but his admirable bodily constitution which seemed to have defied old age was strong enough to fight eight days with death at last after a week of mortal agony he died without once uttering the name of caesar or lucretia who were the two poles around which had turned all his affections and all his crimes his age was seventy-two and he had reigned eleven years caesar perhaps because he had taken less of the fatal beverage perhaps because the strength of his youth overcame the strength of the poison or maybe as some say because when he reached his own rooms he had swallowed an antidote known only to himself was not so prostrated as to lose sight for a moment of the terrible position he was in he summoned his faithful michelotto with those he could best count on among his men and disposed this band in the various rooms that led to his own ordering the chief never to leave the foot of his bed but to sleep lying on a rug his hand upon the handle of his sword the treatment had been the same for caesar as for the pope but in addition to bleeding and emetics strange baths were added which caesar had himself asked for having heard that in a similar case they had once cured ladislaus king of naples four posts strongly welded to the floor and ceiling were set up in his room like the machines at which farriers shoe horses every day a bull was brought in turned over on his back and tied by his four legs to the four posts then when he was thus fixed a cut was made in his belly a foot and a half long through which the intestines were drawn out then caesar slipped into this living bath of blood when the bull was dead caesar was taken out and rolled up in burning hot blankets where after copious perspirations he almost always felt some sort of relief every two hours caesar sent to ask news of his father he hardly waited to hear that he was dead before though still at death's door himself he summoned up all the force of character and presence of mind that naturally belonged to him he ordered michelotto to shut the doors of the vatican before the report of alexander's decease could spread about the town and forbade any one whatsoever to enter the pope's apartments until the money and papers had been removed michelotto obeyed at once went to find cardinal casanova held a dagger at his throat and made him deliver up the keys of the pope's rooms and cabinets then under his guidance took away two chests full of gold which perhaps contained one hundred thousand roman crowns in specie several boxes full of jewels much silver and many precious vases all these were carried to caesar's chamber the guards of the room were doubled 
then the doors of the vatican were once more thrown open and the death of the pope was proclaimed although the news was expected it produced none the less a terrible effect in rome for although caesar was still alive his condition left every one in suspense had the mighty duke of romagna the powerful condottieri who had taken thirty towns and fifteen fortresses in five years been seated sword in hand upon his charger nothing would have been uncertain of fluctuating even for a moment for as caesar afterwards told machiavelli his ambitious soul had provided for all things that could occur on the day of the pope's death except the one that he should be dying himself but being nailed down to his bed sweating off the effects the poison had wrought so though he had kept his power of thinking he could no longer act but must needs wait and suffer the course of events instead of marching on in front and controlling them thus he was forced to regulate his actions no longer by his own plans but according to circumstances his most bitter enemies who could press him hardest were the orsini and the colanas from the one family he had taken their blood from the other their goods so he addressed himself to those to whom he could return what he had taken and opened negotiations with the colanas meanwhile the obsequies of the pope were going forward the vice-chancellor had sent out orders to the highest among the clergy the superiors of convents and the secular orders not to fail to appear according to regular custom on pain of being despoiled of their office and dignities each bringing his own company to the vatican to be present at the pope's funeral each therefore appeared on the day and at the hour appointed at the pontifical palace whence the body was to be conveyed to the church of st peter's and there buried the corpse was found to be abandoned and alone in the mortuary chamber for every one of the name of borgia except caesar lay hidden not knowing what might come to pass this was indeed well justified for fabio orsino meeting one member of the family stabbed him and as a sign of the hatred they had sworn to one another bathed his mouth and hands in the blood the agitation in rome was so great that when the corpse of alexander the sixth was about to enter the church there occurred a kind of panic such as will suddenly arise in times of popular agitation instantly causing so great a disturbance in the funeral cortege that the guards drew up in battle array the clergy fled into the sacristy and the bearers dropped the bier the people tearing off the pall which covered it disclosed the corpse and every one could see with impunity and close at hand the man who fifteen days before had made princes kings and emperors tremble from one end of the world to the other but in accordance with that religious feeling towards death which all men instinctively feel and which alone survives every other even in the heart of the atheist the bier was taken up again and carried to the foot of the great altar in st peter's where set on trestles it was exposed to public view but the body had become so black so deformed and swollen that it was horrible to behold from its nose a bloody matter escaped the mouth gaped hideously and the tongue was so monstrously enlarged that it filled the whole cavity to this frightful appearance was added a decomposition so great that although at the pope's funeral it is customary to kiss the hand which bore the fisherman's ring not one approached to offer this mark of respect and religious reverence to the representative of god on earth towards seven o'clock in the evening when the declining day adds so deep a melancholy to the silence of a church four porters and two working carpenters carried the corpse into the chapel where it was to be interred and lifting it off the catafalque where it lay in state put it in the coffin which was to be its last abode but it was found that the coffin was too short and the body could not be got in till the legs were bent and thrust in with violent blows then the carpenters put on the lid and while one of them sat on top to force the knees to bend the others hammered in the nails amid those shakespearean pleasantries that sound as a last orison in the ear of the mighty then says tomaso tomasi he was placed on the right of the great altar of st peter's beneath a very ugly tomb the next morning this epitaph was found inscribed upon the tomb vendit alexander claves altaria christum emerat ile prius vendere ut potest that is pope alexander sold the christ the altars and the keys but any one who buys a thing may sell it if he please 
End of section 25. Section 26 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G.B. Ives. Section 26. The Borgias, Chapter 15. From the effect produced at Rome by Alexander's death, one may imagine what happened not only in the whole of Italy, but also in the rest of the world. For a moment, Europe swayed, for the column which supported the vault of the political edifice had given way, and the star with eyes of flame and rays of blood, round which all things had revolved for the last eleven years, was now extinguished, and for a moment the world, on a sudden struck motionless, remained in silence and darkness. After the first moment of stupefaction, all who had an injury to avenge arose and hurried to the chase. Savorza retook Pizarro, Baglioni Perugia, Guido and Ubaldo Urbino, and La Rovere Sinagoglia. The Vitelli entered Citta di Castello, the Appiani Piombino, the Orsini Monte Giordano, and their other territories. The Romagna alone remained impassive and loyal, for the people, who have no concern with the quarrels of the great, provided they do not affect themselves, had never been so happy as under the government of Caesar. The Colonnas were pledged to maintain a neutrality, and had been consequently restored to the possession of their castles, and the cities of Chuazano, Capodano, Frasgati, Rocca di Papa, and Nettuno, which they found in a better condition than when they had left them, as the Pope had had them embellished and fortified. Caesar was still in the Vatican with his troops, who, loyal to him in his misfortune, kept watch about the palace, where he was writhing on his bed of pain and roaring like a wounded lion. The cardinals, who had in their first terror fled, each his own way, instead of attending the Pope's obsequies, began to assemble once more, some at the Minerva, others around Cardinal Carafa. Frightened by the troops that Caesar still had, especially since the command was entrusted to Michelotto, they collected all the money they could to levy an army of two thousand soldiers with. Charles Teneo at their head, with the title of captain of the sacred college. It was then hoped that peace was re-established, when it was heard that Prospero Colonna was coming with three thousand men from the side of Naples, and Fabio Orsino from the side of Viterbo with two hundred horse and more than one thousand infantry. Indeed they entered Rome at only one day's interval one from another. By so similar an ardor were they inspired. Thus there were five armies in Rome, Caesar's army holding the Vatican and the Borgo the army of the bishop of Nicastro, who had received from Alexander the guardianship of Castle Santa Angelo, and had shut himself up there, refusing to yield, the army of the sacred college, which was stationed round about the Minerva, the army of Prospero Colonna, which was encamped at the capital, and the army of Fabio Orsino, in barracks at the Ripetta. On their side, the Spaniards had advanced to Terracino and the French to Nepi, the cardinals saw that Rome now stood upon a mine which the least spark might cause to explode. They summoned the ambassadors of the Emperor of Germany, the kings of France and Spain, and the Republic of Venice to raise their voice in the name of their masters. The ambassadors, impressed with the urgency of the situation, began by declaring the sacred college inviolable. They then ordered the Orsini, the Colonnas, and the Duke of Valentinois to leave Rome and go each his own way. The Orsini were the first to submit. The next morning their example was followed by the Colonnas. No one was left but Caesar, who said he was willing to go, but desired to make his conditions beforehand. The Vatican was undermined, he declared, and if his demands were refused, he and those who came to take him should be blown up together. It was known that his were never empty threats they came to terms with. Caesar promised to remain ten miles away from Rome the whole time the conclave lasted, and not to take any action against the town or any other of the ecclesiastical states.
Fabio Orsino and Prospero Colonna had made the same promises. It was agreed that Caesar should quit Rome with his army, artillery, and baggage, and to ensure his not being attacked or molested in the streets, the sacred college should add to his numbers four hundred infantry, who, in case of attack or insult, would fight for him. The Venetian ambassador answered for the Orsini, the Spanish ambassador for the Colonnas, the ambassador of France for Caesar. At the day and hour appointed, Caesar sent out his artillery, which consisted of eighteen pieces of cannon and four hundred infantry of the sacred college, on each of whom he bestowed a ducat. Behind the artillery came a hundred chariots escorted by his advance guard. The duke was carried out of the gate of the Vatican. He lay on a bed covered with a scarlet canopy, supported by twelve halberdiers, leaning forward on his cushions so that no one might see his face, with its purple lips and bloodshot eyes. Beside him was his naked sword, to show that, feeble as he was, he could use it at need. His finest charger, caparisoned in black velvet embroidered with his arms, walked beside the bed, led by a page, so that Caesar could mount in case of surprise or attack. Before him and behind, both right and left, marched his army, their arms at rest, but without beating of drums or blowing of trumpets. This gave a somber funereal air to the whole procession, which at the gate of the city met Prospero Colonna awaiting it with a considerable band of men. Caesar thought at first that, breaking his word as he had so often done himself, Prospero Colonna was going to attack him. He ordered a halt, and prepared to mount his horse. But Prospero Colonna, seeing the state he was in, advanced to his bedside alone. He came, against expectation, to offer him an escort, fearing an ambuscade on the part of Fabio Orsino, who had loudly sworn that he would lose his honor or avenge the death of Paolo Orsina, his father. Caesar thanked Colonna, and replied that from the moment that Orsini stood alone, he ceased to fear him. Then Colonna saluted the duke, and rejoined his men, directing them towards Albano, while Caesar took the road to Cita Castellana, which had remained loyal. When there, Caesar found himself not only master of his own fate, but of others as well. Of the twenty-two votes he owned in the sacred college, twelve had remained faithful, and as the conclave was composed in all of thirty-seven cardinals, he with his twelve votes could make the majority inclined to whichever side he chose. Accordingly, he was courted both by the Spanish and the French party, each desiring the election of a pope of their own nation. Caesar listened, promising nothing and refusing nothing. He gave his twelve votes to Francesco Piccolomini, cardinal of Siena, one of his father's creatures who had remained his friend, and the latter was elected on the 8th of October and took the name of Pius III. Caesar's hopes did not deceive him. Pius III was hardly elected before he sent him a safe conduct to Rome. The duke came back with 250 men at arms, 250 light horse, and 800 infantry, and lodged in his palace, the soldiers camping round about. Meanwhile the Orsini, pursuing their projects of vengeance against Caesar, had been levying many troops at Perugia, and the neighborhood to bring against him to Rome, as they fancied that France, in whose service they were engaged, was humoring the duke for the sake of the twelve votes, which were wanted to secure the election of Cardinal Amboise at the next conclave, they went over to the service of Spain. Meanwhile, Caesar was signing a new treaty with Louis the Twelfth, by which he engaged to support him with all his forces, and even with his person, so soon as he could ride, in maintaining his conquest of Naples. Louis, on his side, guaranteed that he should retain the possession of the states he still held, and promised his help in recovering those he had lost. The day when this treaty was made known, Gonzalvo de Cordova proclaimed to the sound of a trumpet in all the streets of Rome that every Spanish subject serving in a foreign army was at once to break his engagement on pain of being found guilty of high treason. This measure robbed Caesar of ten or twelve of his best officers, and of nearly three hundred men. Then the Orsini, seeing his army thus reduced, entered Rome, supported by the Spanish ambassador, and summoned Caesar to appear before the Pope and the Sacred College, and give an account of his crimes. 
Faithful to his engagements, Pius III replied that in his quality of sovereign prince, the duke in his temporal administration was quite independent and was answerable for his actions to God alone. But as the Pope felt he could not much longer support Caesar against his enemies for all his good will, he advised him to try to join the French army, which was still advancing on Naples, in the midst of which he would alone find safety. Caesar resolved to retire to Bracciano, where Gian Giordano Orsino, who had once gone with him to France, and who was the only member of the family who had not declared against him, offered him an asylum in the name of Cardinal Dumest. So one morning he offered his troops to march for this town, and, taking his place in their midst, he left Rome. But though Caesar had kept his intentions quiet, the Orsini had been forewarned and, taking out all the troops they had by the gate of San Pacrocio, they had made a long detour and blocked Caesar's way. So, when the latter arrived at Storta, he found the Orsini's army drawn up awaiting him in numbers exceeding his own by at least one half. Caesar saw that to come to blows in his then feeble state was to rush on certain destruction. So he ordered his troops to retire, and, being a first-rate strategist, echelon his retreat so skillfully that his enemies though they followed dared not attack him and he re-entered the pontifical town without the loss of a single man this time caesar went straight to the vatican to put himself more directly under the pope's protection he distributed his soldiers about the palace so as to guard all its exits now the orsini resolved to make an end of caesar had determined to attack him wheresoever he might be with no regard to the sanctity of the place. This they attempted, but without success, as Caesar's men kept a good guard on every side, and offered a strong defense. Then the Orsini, not being able to force the guard of the castle Sant'Angelo, hoped to succeed better with the duke, by leaving Rome, and then returning by the Torriani gate. But Caesar anticipated this move, and they found the gate guarded and barricaded. Nonetheless, they pursued their design, seeking by open violence the vengeance they had hoped to obtain by craft, and, having surprised the approaches to the gate, set fire to it. A passage gained, they made their way into the gardens of the castle, where they found Caesar awaiting them at the head of his cavalry. Face to face with danger, the duke had found his old strength, and he was the first to rush upon his enemies, loudly challenging Orsino in the hope of killing him should they meet but either Orsino did not hear him, or dared not fight, and after an exciting contest, Caesar, who was numerically two-thirds weaker than his enemy, saw his cavalry cut to pieces, and after performing miracles of personal strength and courage, was obliged to return to the Vatican. There he found the Pope in mortal agony. The Orsini, tired of contending against the old man's word of honor pledged to the Duke, had by the interposition of Pandolfo Petrucci, gained the ear of the Pope's surgeon, who placed a poison plaster upon a wound in his leg. The Pope then was actually dying when Caesar, covered with dust and blood, entered his room, pursued by his enemies, who knew no check till they reached the palace walls, behind which the remnant of his army still held their ground. Pius the Third, who knew he was about to die, sat up in his bed, gave Caesar the key of the corridor which led to the castle Sant'Angelo, and an order addressed to the governor to admit him and his family, to defend him to the last extremity, and to let him go wherever he thought fit, and then fell fainting on his bed. Caesar took his two daughters by the hand, and, followed by the little dukes of Sermonetta and Nepi, took refuge in the last asylum open to him. The same night the Pope died. He had reigned only twenty-six days. After his death, Caesar, who had cast himself fully dressed upon his bed, heard his door open at two o'clock in the morning. Not knowing what any one might want of him at such an hour, he raised himself on one elbow and felt for the handle of his sword with his other hand. But at first glance he recognized his nocturnal visitor, Giuliano de la Rovere. Utterly exhausted by the poison, abandoned by his troops, fallen as he was from the height of his power, Caesar, who could now do nothing for himself, could yet make a pope. Giuliano della Rovere had come to buy the votes of his twelve cardinals. Caesar imposed his conditions, which were accepted. 
If elected, Giuliano de la Rivere was to help Caesar to recover his territories in Romagna. Caesar was to remain general of the church, and Francesco Maria de la Rovere, prefect of Rome, was to marry one of Caesar's daughters. On these conditions, Caesar sold his twelve cardinals to Giuliano. The next day, at Giuliano's request, the sacred college ordered the Orsini to leave Rome for the whole time occupied by the conclave. On the 31st of October, 1503, at the first scrutiny, Giuliano de la Rovere was elected Pope, and took the name of Julius II. He was scarcely installed in the Vatican when he made it his first care to summon Caesar and give him his former rooms there. Then, since the Duke was fully restored to health, he began to busy himself with the re-establishment of his affairs, which had suffered sadly of late. The defeat of his army and his own escape to Sant'Angelo, where he was supposed to be a prisoner, had brought about great changes in Romagna. Cesena was once more in the power of the church, as formerly it had been. Gian Savorza had again entered Pizarro. Ordelafi had seized Forli. Malatesta was laying claim to Rimini. The inhabitants of Imola had assassinated their governor, and the town was divided between two opinions one that it should be put into the hands of the Riani, the other into the hands of the church. Fainza had remained loyal longer than any other place, but at last, losing hope of seeing Caesar recover his power, it had summoned Francesco, a natural son of Galeotto Manfredi, the last surviving heir of this unhappy family, all whose legitimate descendants had been massacred by Borgia. It is true that the fortresses of these different places had taken no part in these revolutions, and had remained immutably faithful to the Duke of Valentinois. So it was not precisely the defection of these towns, which, thanks to their fortresses, might be reconquered, that was the cause of uneasiness to Caesar and Julius II. It was the difficult situation that Venice had thrust upon them. Venice, in the spring of the same year, had signed a treaty of peace with the Turks. Thus set free from her eternal enemy, she had just led her forces to the Romagna, which she had always coveted. These troops had been led towards Ravenna, the farthermost limit of the papal estates, and put under the command of Giacomo Venieri, who had failed to capture Cassena, and had only failed through the courage of its inhabitants. But this check had been amply compensated by the surrender of the fortresses of Val di Lamani and Fainza by the capture of Farlim Popoli, and the surrender of Rimini, which Pandolfo Malatesta, its lord, exchanged for the sovereignty of Cittadella, in the state of Padua, and for the rank of gentlemen of Venice. Then Caesar made a proposition to Julius II. This was to make a momentary secession to the church of his own estates in Romagna, so that the respect felt by the Venetians for the church might save these towns from their aggressors. But, says Gucciardini, Julius II, whose ambition, so natural in sovereign leaders, had not yet extinguished the remains of rectitude, refused to accept the places, afraid of exposing himself to the temptation of keeping them later on, against his promises. But as the case was urgent, he proposed to Caesar that he should leave Rome, embark at Ostia, and cross over to Spezia where Michelotto was to meet him at the head of one hundred men-at-arms and one hundred light horse, the only remnant of his magnificent army, thence by land to Ferrara, and from Ferrara to Imala, where, once arrived, he could utter his war cry so loud that it would be heard through the length and breadth of Romagna. This advice being after Caesar's own heart, he accepted it at once. The resolution submitted to the sacred college was approved, and Caesar left for Ostia, accompanied by Bartolomeo de la Rovere, nephew of his holiness. Caesar at last felt he was free, and fancied himself already on his good charger, a second time carrying war into all the places where he had formerly fought. When he reached Ostia, he was met by the cardinals of Sorrento and Volterra, who came in the name of Julius II to ask him to give up the very same citadels which he had refused three days before. The fact was that the Pope had learned in the interim that the Venetians had made fresh aggressions, and recognized that the method proposed by Caesar was the only one that would check them. But this time it was Caesar's turn to refuse, for he was weary of these tergiversations and feared a trap. So he said that the surrender asked for would be useless, 
since by God's help he should be in Romagna before eight days were passed. So the cardinals of Sorrento and Volterra returned to Rome with a refusal. The next morning, just as Caesar was setting foot on his vessel, he was arrested in the name of Julius II. He thought at first that this was the end. He was used to this mode of action, and knew how short was the space between a prison and a tomb. The matter was all the easier in his case, because the Pope, if he chose, would have plenty of pretext for making a case against him. But the heart of Julius was of another kind from his, swift to anger, but open to clemency. So, when the Duke came back to Rome guarded, the momentary irritation his refusal had caused was already calmed, and the Pope received him in his usual fashion at his palace, and with his ordinary courtesy, although from the beginning it was easy for the Duke to see that he was being watched. In return for this kind of reception, Caesar consented to yield the fortress of Cassena to the Pope, as being a town which had once belonged to the church, and now should return giving the deed, signed by Caesar, to one of his captains, called Pietro de Oviedo, he ordered him to take possession of the fortress in the name of the Holy See. Pietro obeyed, and starting at once for Cassena, presented himself armed with his warrant before Don Diego Chinon, a noble condottieri of Spain, who was holding the fortress in Caesar's name. But when he had read over the paper that Pietro de Oviedo brought, Don Diego replied that as he knew his lord and master was a prisoner, it would be disgraceful in him to obey an order that had probably been wrested from him by violence, and that the bearer deserved to die for undertaking such a cowardly office. He therefore bade his soldiers seize de Oviedo, and flung him down from the top of the walls. This sentence was promptly executed. This mark of fidelity might have proved fatal to Caesar, when the Pope heard how his messenger had been treated, he flew into such a rage that the prisoner thought a second time that his hour was come, and in order to receive his liberty, he made the first of those new propositions to Julius the Second, which were drawn up in the form of a treaty and sanctioned by a bull. By these arrangements, the Duke of Valentinois was bound to hand over to His Holiness, within the space of forty days, the fortresses of Cassena and Bertinoro, and authorized the surrender of Forli. This arrangement was guaranteed by two bankers in Rome who were responsible for 15,000 ducats, the sum total of the expenses which the governor pretended he had incurred in the place on the duke's account. The pope, on his part, engaged to send Caesar to Ostia, under the sole guard of the cardinal of Santa Croce and two officers, who were to give him his full liberty on the very day when his engagements were fulfilled. Should this not happen, Caesar was to be taken to Rome and imprisoned in the castle of St. Angelo. In fulfillment of this treaty, Caesar went down the Tiber as far as Ostia, accompanied by the Pope's treasurer and many of his servants. The Cardinal of Santa Croce followed, and the next day joined him there. But as Caesar feared that Julius II might keep him a prisoner, in spite of his pledged word after he had yielded up the fortresses, he asked, through the mediation of Cardinals Borgia and Remolina, who, not feeling safe at Rome, had retired to Naples, for a safe conduct to Gonzalvo of Cordova, and for two ships to take him there. With the return of the courier, the safe conduct arrived, announcing that the ships would shortly follow. In the midst of all this, the Cardinal of Santa Croce, learning that by the duke's orders the governors of Cassena and Bertinoro had surrendered their fortresses to the captains of his holiness relaxed his rigor and knowing that his prisoner would some day or other be free began to let him go out without a guard then caesar feeling some fear lest when he started with gonzalvo's ships the same thing might happen as on the occasion of his embarking on the pope's vessel that is that he might be arrested a second time concealed himself in a house outside the town, and when night came on, mounting a wretched horse that belonged to a peasant, rode as far as Netuno, and there hired a little boat, in which he embarked for Monte Dragone, and thence gained Naples. Gonzalo received him with such joy that Caesar was deceived as to his intention, and this time believed that he was really saved. His confidence was redoubled when, opening his designs to Gonzalo, and telling him that he counted upon gaining Pisa and thence going on into Romagna. Gonzalva allowed him to recruit as many soldiers at Naples as he pleased, promising him two ships to embark with. 
Caesar, deceived by these appearances, stopped nearly six weeks at Naples, every day seeing the Spanish governor and discussing his plans. But Gonzalvo was only waiting to gain time to tell the king of Spain that his enemy was in his hands, and Caesar actually went to the castle to bid Gonzalvo goodbye, thinking he was about to start after he had embarked his men on the two ships. The Spanish governor received him with his accustomed courtesy, wished him every kind of prosperity, and embraced him as he left. But at the door of the castle, Caesar found one of Gonzalvo's captains, Nuno Capahea by name, who arrested him as a prisoner of Ferdinand the Catholic. Caesar at these words heaved a deep sigh, cursing the ill luck that had made him trust the word of an enemy when he had so often broken his own. He was at once taken to the castle, where the prison gate closed behind him, and he felt no hope that any one would come to his aid. For the only being who was devoted to him in this world was Michelotto, and he had heard that Michelotto had been arrested near Pisa by order of Julius II. While Caesar was being taken to prison, an officer came to him to deprive him of the safe conduct given him by Gonzalvo. The day after his arrest, which occurred on the 27th of May, 1504, Caesar was taken aboard a ship, which at once weighed anchor and set sail for Spain. During the whole voyage he had but one page to serve him, and as soon as he disembarked he was taken to the castle of Medina del Campo. Ten years later, Gonzalvo, who at that time was himself proscribed, owned to Loxa on his dying bed that now, when he was to appear in the presence of God, two things weighed cruelly on his conscience. One was his treason to Ferdinand, the other his breach of faith toward Caesar. End of section 26「Section 27 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 27. The Borgias. Chapter 16 Cesar was in prison for two years, always hoping that Louis the Twelfth would reclaim him as peer of the Kingdom of France. But Louis, much disturbed by the loss of the Battle of Garigliano, which robbed him of the Kingdom of Naples, had enough to do with his own affairs without busying himself with his cousins. So the prisoner was beginning to despair, when one day, as he broke his bread at breakfast, he found a file and a little bottle containing a narcotic, with a letter from Michelotto, saying that he was out of prison and had left Italy for Spain, and now lay in hiding with the Count of Benevento in the neighboring village. He added that from the next day forward he and the Count would wait every night on the road between the fortress and the village with three excellent horses. It was now Cesar's part to do the best he could with his bottle and file. When the whole world had abandoned the Duke of Romagna, he had been remembered by a Sbirro. The prison where he had been shut up for two years was so hateful to Cesar that he lost not a single moment. The same day he attacked one of the bars of a window that looked out upon an inner court, and soon contrived so to manipulate it that it would need only a final push to come out. But not only was the window nearly seventy feet from the ground, but one could only get out of the court by using an exit reserved for the governor, of which he alone had the key. Also this key never left him. By day it hung at his waist. By night it was under his pillow. This, then, was the chief difficulty. But, prisoner though he was, Cesar had always been treated with the respect due to his name and rank. Every day at the dinner hour he was conducted from the room that served as his prison to the governor, who did the honors of the table in a grand and courteous fashion. The fact was that Don Manuel had served with honor under King Ferdinand, and therefore, while he guarded Cesar rigorously according to orders, he had a great respect for so brave a general, and took pleasure in listening to the accounts of his battles. 
so he had often insisted that Cesar should not only dine, but also breakfast with him. Happily the prisoner, yielding perhaps to some presentiment, had till now refused this favor. This was of great advantage to him, since, thanks to his solitude, he had been able to receive the instruments of escape sent by Michelotto. The same day he received them, Cesar, on going back to his room, made a false step and sprained his foot. At the dinner hour he tried to go down, but pretended to be suffering so cruelly that he gave it up. The governor came to see him in his room and found him stretched upon the bed. The day after he was no better. The governor had his dinner sent in, and came to see him as on the night before. He found his prisoner so dejected and gloomy in his solitude that he offered to come and sup with him. Cesar gratefully accepted. This time it was the prisoner who did the honors. Cesar was charmingly courteous. The governor thought he would profit by this lack of restraint to put to him certain questions as to the manner of his arrest, and asked him, as an old Castilian, for whom honor is still of some account, what the truth really was as to Gonzalvo's and Ferdinand's breach of faith with him. Cesar appeared extremely inclined to give him his entire confidence, but showed by a sign that the attendants were in the way. This precaution appeared quite natural, and the governor took no offence, but hastened to send them all away, so as to be the sooner alone with his companion. When the door was shut, Cesar filled his glass and the governor's, proposing the king's health. The governor honoured the toast. Cesar at once began his tale, but he had scarcely uttered a third part of it when, interesting as it was, the eyes of his host shut as though by magic, and he slid under the table in a profound sleep. After half an hour had passed, the servants, hearing no noise, entered and found the two, one on the table, the other under it. This event was not so extraordinary that they paid any great attention to it. All they did was to carry Don Manuel to his room and lift Cesar on the bed. Then they put away the remnant of the meal for the next day's supper, shut the door very carefully, and left their prisoner alone. Cesar stayed for a minute motionless, and apparently plunged in the deepest sleep, but when he heard the steps retreating, he quietly raised his head, opened his eyes, slipped off the bed, walked to the door, slowly indeed, but not to all appearance feeling the accident of the night before, and applied his ear for some minutes to the keyhole. Then, lifting his head with an expression of indescribable pride, he wiped his brow with his hand, and for the first time since his guards went out, breathed freely with full-drawn breaths. There was no time to lose. His first care was to shut the door as securely on the inside as it was already shut on the outside, to blow out the lamp, to open the window, and to finish sawing through the bar. When this was done, he undid the bandages on his leg, took down the window and bed curtains, tore them into strips, joined the sheets, table napkins, and cloth, and with all these things tied together end to end, formed a rope fifty or sixty feet long, with knots every here and there. This rope he fixed securely to the bar next to the one he had just cut through, then he climbed up to the window and began what was really the hardest part of his perilous enterprise, clinging with hands and feet to this fragile support. Luckily he was both strong and skillful, and he went down the whole length of the rope without accident. But when he reached the end, and was hanging on the last knot, he sought in vain to touch the ground with his feet. His rope was too short. The situation was a terrible one. The darkness of the night prevented the fugitive from seeing how far off he was from the ground, and his fatigue prevented him from even attempting to climb up again. Cesar put up a brief prayer, whether to God or Satan, he alone could say. Then, letting go the rope, he dropped from a height of twelve or fifteen feet. The danger was too great for the fugitive to trouble about a few trifling contusions. 
he at once rose and guiding himself by the direction of his window he went straight to the little door of exit he then put his hand into the pocket of his doublet and a cold sweat damped his brow either he had forgotten and left it in his room or had lost it in his fall anyhow he had not the key but summoning his recollections he quite gave up the first idea for the second which was the only likely one again he crossed the court looking for the place where the key might have fallen by the aid of the wall round a tank on which he had laid his hand when he got up but the object of search was so small and the night so dark that there was little chance of getting any result still cesar sought for it for in this key was his last hope suddenly a door was opened and a night watch appeared preceded by two torches cesar for the moment thought he was lost but remembering the tank behind him he dropped into it and with nothing but his head above water anxiously watched the movements of the soldiers as they advanced beside him passed only a few feet away crossed the court and then disappeared by an opposite door but short as their luminous apparition had been it had lighted up the ground and cesar by the glare of the torches had caught the glitter of the long-sought key and as soon as the door was shut behind the men was again master of his liberty halfway between the castle and the village two cavaliers and a led horse were waiting for him the two men were Michelotto and the Count of Benevento. Cesar sprang upon the riderless horse, pressed with fervor the hand of the Count and the Sbirro, then all three galloped to the frontier of Navarre, where they arrived three days later, and were honorably received by the King, Jean d'Albret, the brother of Cesar's wife. From Navarre he thought to pass into France, and from France to make an attempt upon Italy with the aid of Louis the Twelfth, But during Cesar's detention in the castle of Medina del Campo, Louis had made peace with the King of Spain, and when he heard of Cesar's flight, instead of helping him, as there was some reason to expect he would, since he was a relative by marriage, he took away the Duchy of Valentinois and also his pension. Still, Cesar had nearly two hundred thousand ducats in the charge of bankers at Genoa. He wrote asking for this sum, with which he hoped to levy troops in Spain and in Navarre, and make an attempt upon Pisa. Five hundred men, two hundred thousand ducats, his name and his word, were more than enough to save him from despair. The bankers denied the deposit. Cesar was at the mercy of his brother-in-law. One of the vassals of the King of Navarre, named Prince Alarino, had just then revolted. Cesar then took command of the army which Jean d'Albret was sending out against him, followed by Michelotto, who was as faithful in adversity as ever before. Thanks to Cesar's courage and skilful tactics, Prince Alarino was beaten in a first encounter but the day after his defeat he rallied his army and offered battle about three o'clock in the afternoon cesar accepted it for nearly four hours they fought obstinately on both sides but at length as the day was going down cesar proposed to decide the issue by making a charge himself at the head of a hundred men-at-arms upon a body of cavalry which made his adversary's chief force to his great astonishment, this cavalry at the first shock gave way and took flight in the direction of a little wood, where they seemed to be seeking refuge. Cesar followed close on their heels up to the edge of the forest. Then suddenly the pursued turned right about face, three or four hundred archers came out of the wood to help them, and Cesar's men, seeing that they had fallen into an ambush, took to their heels like cowards, and abandoned their leader. Left alone, Cesar would not budge one step. Possibly he had had enough of life, and his heroism was rather the result of satiety than courage. However that may be, he defended himself like a lion, but riddled with arrows and bolts, his horse at last fell, with Cesar's leg under him. 
his adversaries rushed upon him, and one of them thrusting a sharp and slender iron pike through a weak place in his armor, pierced his breast. Caesar cursed God and died but the rest of the enemy's army was defeated thanks to the courage of Michelotto, who fought like a valiant condottiere, but learned on returning to the camp in the evening from those who had fled that they had abandoned Caesar and that he had never reappeared. Then only too certain from his master's well-known courage that disaster had occurred, he desired to give one last proof of his devotion by not leaving his body to the wolves and birds of prey. Torches were lighted, for it was dark, and with ten or twelve of those who had gone with Caesar as far as the little wood, he went to seek his master. On reaching the spot they pointed out, he beheld five men stretched side by side. Four of them were dressed, but the fifth had been stripped of his clothing and lay completely naked. Michelotto dismounted, lifted the head upon his knees, and by the light of the torches, recognized Caesar. Thus fell, on the 10th of March, 1507, on an unknown field near an obscure village called Vian, in a wretched skirmish with the vassal of a petty king, the man whom Machiavelli presents to all princes as the model of ability, diplomacy, and courage. As to Lucrezia, the fair Duchess of Ferrara, she died full of years and honors adored as a queen by her subjects, and sung as a goddess by Ariosto and by Bembo. End of section 27 Section 28 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 28. Epilogue. There was once in Paris, says Boccaccio, a brave and good merchant named Jean de Sivingy, who did a great trade in drapery and was connected in business with a neighbor and fellow merchant, a very rich man called Abraham, who, though a Jew, enjoyed a good reputation. Jean de Sivingy, appreciating the qualities of the worthy Israelite, feared lest, good man as he was, his false religion would bring his soul straight to eternal perdition, so he began to urge him, gently as a friend, to renounce his errors and open his eyes to the Christian faith, which he could see for himself was prospering and spreading day by day, being the only true and good religion, whereas his own creed, it was very plain, was so quickly diminishing that it would soon disappear from the face of the earth. The Jew replied that except in his own religion there was no salvation, that he was born in it, proposed to live and die in it, and that he knew nothing in the world that could change his opinion. Still, in his proselytizing fervor, Jean would not think himself beaten, and never a day passed but he demonstrated with those fair words the merchant uses to seduce a customer, the superiority of the Christian religion above the Jewish, and although Abraham was a great master of Mosaic law, he began to enjoy his friend's preaching, either because of the friendship he felt for him, or because the Holy Ghost descended upon the tongue of the new apostle. Still obstinate in his own belief, he would not change. The more he persisted in his error, the more excited was Jean about converting him, so that at last, by God's help, being somewhat shaken by his friend's urgency, Abraham one day said, Listen, Jean, since you have it so much at heart that I should be converted, behold me disposed to satisfy you. But before I go to Rome to see him who you call God's vicar on earth, I must study his manner of life and his morals, as also those of his brethren, the cardinals. And if, as I doubt not, they are in harmony with what you preach, I will admit that, as you have taken such pains to show me, your faith is better than mine, and I will do as you desire." but if I should prove otherwise, I shall remain a Jew, as I was before, for it is not worth while at my age to change my belief for a worse one. Jean was very sad when he heard these words, and he was mournful to himself. Now I have lost my time and pains, 
which I thought I had spent so well when I was hoping to convert this unhappy Abraham, for if he unfortunately goes, as he says he will, to the court of Rome, and there sees the shameful life led by the servants of the church, instead of becoming a Christian, the Jew will be more of a Jew than ever. Then turning to Abraham, he said, Ah, friend, why do you wish to incur such fatigue and expense by going to Rome, besides the fact that travelling by sea or by land must be very dangerous for so rich a man as you are? Do you suppose there is no one here to baptize you? If you have any doubts concerning the faith I have expounded, where better than here will you find theologians capable of contending with them and allaying them? So, you see, this voyage seems to me quite unnecessary. Just imagine that the priests there are such as you see here, and all the better in that they are nearer to the supreme pastor. If you are guided by my advice, you will postpone this toil till you have committed some grave sin and need absolution. Then you and I will go together. But the Jew replied, I believe, dear Jean, that everything is as you tell me, but you know how obstinate I am. I will go to Rome, or I will never be a Christian. Then Jean, seeing his great wish, resolved that it was no use trying to thwart him, and wished him good luck, but in his heart he gave up all hope, for it was certain that his friend would come back from his pilgrimage more of a Jew than ever, if the court of Rome was still as he had seen it. But Abraham mounted his horse, and at his best speed took the road to Rome, where, on his arrival, he was wonderfully well received by his co-religionists, and after staying there a good long time, he began to study the behaviour of the Pope, the cardinals, and other prelates, and of the whole court. But much to his surprise he found out, partly by what passed under his eyes, and partly by what he was told, that all from the Pope downward to the lowest sacristan of St. Peter's were committing the sins of luxurious living in a most disgraceful and unbridled manner, with no remorse and no shame, so that pretty women and handsome youths could obtain any favours they pleased. In addition to this sensuality which they exhibited in public, he saw that they were gluttons and drunkards, so much so that they were more the slaves of the belly than are the greediest of animals. When he looked a little further, he found them so avaricious and fond of money that they sold for hard cash both human bodies and divine offices, and with less conscience than a man in Paris would sell cloth or any other merchandise. Seeing this, and much more that it would not be proper to set down here, it seemed to Abraham, himself a chaste, sober, and upright man, that he had seen enough. So he resolved to return to Paris, and carried out the resolution with his usual promptitude. Jean de Sivinchy held a great fete in honour of his return, although he had lost hope of his coming back converted. But he left time for him to settle down before he spoke of anything, thinking there would be plenty of time to hear the bad news he expected. But after a few days of rest, Abraham himself came to see his friend, and Jean ventured to ask what he thought of the Holy Father, the Cardinals, and the other persons at the pontifical court. At these words the Jew exclaimed, "'God damn them all! I never once succeeded in finding among them any holiness, any devotion, any good works, but, on the contrary, luxurious living, avarice, greed, fraud, envy, pride, and even worse, if there is worse, all the machine seemed to be set in motion by an impulse less divine than diabolical.' After what I saw, it is my firm conviction that your Pope, and of course the others as well, are using all their talents, art, endeavours to banish the Christian religion from the face of the earth, though they ought to be its foundation and support. And since, in spite of all the care and trouble they expend to arrive at this end, I see that your religion is spreading every day and becoming more brilliant and more pure. It is borne in upon me that the Holy Spirit himself protects it as the only true and the most holy religion. This is why, deaf as you found me to your counsel and rebellious to your wish, I am now, ever since I returned from this Sodom, firmly resolved on becoming a Christian. So let us go at once to the church, for I am quite ready to be baptized. There is no need to say if Jean de Sivangy, who expected a refusal, was pleased at this consent. Without delay, he went with his godson to Notre-Dame de Paris, 
where he prayed the first priest he met to administer baptism to his friend, and this was speedily done, and the new convert changed his Jewish name of Abraham into the Christian name of Jean, and as the neophyte, thanks to his journey to Rome, had gained a profound belief, his natural good qualities increased so greatly in the practice of our holy religion, that after leading an exemplary life he died in the full order of sanctity. This tale of Boccaccio's gives so admirable an answer to the charge of irreligion which some might make against us if they mistook our intentions, that, as we shall not offer any other reply, we have not hesitated to present it entire, as it stands, to the eyes of our readers. And let us never forget that if the papacy has had an innocent eighth and an Alexander VI, who are in its shame, it also has a pious and a Gregory sixteen, who are in its honour and glory. End of section 28section twenty nine of celebrated crimes volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by miriam esther goldman celebrated crimes volume one by alexander dumas translated by g b ives section twenty nine the chenchi part one the Chenchi, 1598, by Alexandre Dumas, Père. Should you ever go to Rome and visit the Villa Pamphili, no doubt, after having sought under its tall pines and along its canal the shade and freshness so rare in the capital of the Christian world, you will descend towards the Gianniculum Hill by a charming road, in the middle of which you will find the Pauline Fountain. Having passed this monument, and having lingered a moment on the terrace of the church of St. Peter Montorio, which commands the whole of Rome, you will find the cloister of Bramante, in the middle of which, sunk a few feet below the level, is built, on the identical place where St. Peter was crucified, a little temple, half Greek, half Christian. You will thence ascend by a side door into the church itself. There the attentive Ciceroni will show you, in the first chapel to the right, the Christ Scourged, by Sebastian del Piombo, and in the third chapel to the left, an entombment by Fiamingo. Having examined these two masterpieces at leisure, he will take you to each end of the transverse cross, and will show you on one side a picture by Salviati on slate, and on the other a work by Vasari then pointing out in melancholy tones a copy of guido's martyrdom of saint peter on the high altar he will relate to you how for three centuries the divine raphael's transfiguration was worshipped in that spot how it was carried away by the french in eighteen o nine and restored to the pope by the allies in eighteen fourteen as you have already in all probability admired this masterpiece in the vatican allow him to expatiate and search at the foot of the altar for a mortuary slab which you will identify by a cross and a single word orate under this gravestone is buried beatrice cenci whose tragical story cannot but impress you profoundly she was the daughter of francesco cenci whether or not it be true that men are born in harmony with their epoch and that some embody its good qualities and others its bad ones, it may nevertheless interest our readers to cast a rapid glance over the period which had just passed when the events which we are about to relate took place. Francesco Cenci will then appear to them as the diabolical incarnation of his time. On the 11th of August, 1492, after the lingering death agony of Innocent the Eighth, during which two hundred and twenty murders were committed in the streets of rome alexander the sixth ascended to the pontifical throne son of a sister of pope calixtus the third rodrigo lenzuoli borgia before being created cardinal had five children by rosa venozza whom he afterwards caused to be married to a rich roman these children were francis duke of gandia caesar bishop and cardinal afterwards duke of valentinois lucrezia who was married four times 
Her first husband was Giovanni Sforza, lord of Pesaro, whom she left owing to his impotence. The second, Alfonso, duke of Basilia, whom her brother Caesar caused to be assassinated. The third, Alfonso de Este, duke of Ferrara, from whom a second divorce separated her. Finally, the fourth, Alfonso of Aragon, who was stabbed to death on the steps of the Basilica of St. Peter, and afterwards, three weeks later, strangled, because he did not die soon enough from his wounds, which nevertheless were mortal. Geoffrey, Count of Squilace, of whom little is known, and finally a youngest son, of whom nothing at all is known. The most famous of these three brothers was Caesar Borgia. He had made every arrangement a plotter could make to be king of Italy at the death of his father the Pope, and his measures were so carefully taken as to leave no doubt in his own mind as to the success of this vast project. Every chance was provided against except one, but Satan himself could hardly have foreseen this particular one. The reader will judge for himself. The Pope had invited Cardinal Adrian to supper in his vineyard on the Belvedere. Cardinal Adrian was very rich, and the Pope wished to inherit his wealth, as he already had acquired that of the cardinals of Sant'Angelo, Capua, and Modena. To effect this, Caesar Borgia sent two bottles of poisoned wine to his father's cupbearer, without taking him into his confidence. He only instructed him not to serve this wine till he himself gave orders to do so. Unfortunately, during supper, the cup-bearer left his post for a moment, and in this interval a careless butler served the poisoned wine to the Pope, to Caesar Borgia, and to Cardinal Cornetto. Alexander the Sixth died some hours afterwards. Caesar Borgia was confined to bed and sloughed off his skin while Cardinal Cornetto lost his sight and his senses, and was brought to death's door. Pius III succeeded Alexander VI, and reigned twenty-five days. On the twenty-sixth, he was poisoned also. Caesar Borgia had under his control eighteen Spanish cardinals, who owed to them their places in the sacred college. These cardinals were entirely his creatures, and he could command them absolutely. As he was in a moribund condition and could make no use of them for himself, he sold them to Giuliano della Rovere, and Giuliano della Rovere was elected Pope under the name of Julius the Second. To the Rome of Nero succeeded the Athens of Pericles. Leo the Tenth succeeded Julius the Second, and under his pontificate Christianity assumed a pagan character, which, passing from art into manners, gives to this epoch a strange complexion. Crimes for the moment disappeared, to give place to vices, but to charming vices, vices in good taste, such as those indulged in by Alcibiades and sung by Catullus. Leo X died after having assembled under his reign, which lasted eight years, eight months, and nineteen days, Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci, Correggio, Titian, Andrea del Sarto, Fra Bartolomeo, Giulio Romano, Ariosto, Giuciardini, and Machiavelli. Giulio di Medici and Pompeo Colonna were again rival candidates. Intrigues recommenced, and the conclave was once more so divided that at one time the cardinals thought they could only escape the difficulty in which they were placed by doing what they had done before, and electing a third competitor. They were even talking about Cardinal Orsini, when Giulio de' Medici, one of the rival candidates, hit upon a very ingenious expedient. He wanted only five votes. Five of his partisans each offered to bet five of Colonna's a hundred thousand ducats to ten thousand against the election of Giulio de' Medici. At the very first ballot after the wager, Giulio de' Medici got the five votes he wanted. No objection could be made. The cardinals had not been bribed. They had made a bet. That was all. Thus it happened. On the 18th of November, 1523, Giulio de' Medici was proclaimed Pope under the name of Clement the Seventh. That same day, he generously paid the 500,000 ducats which his five partisans had lost. It was under this pontificate 
and during the seven months in which Rome, conquered by the Lutheran soldiers of the Constable of Bourbon, saw holy things subjected to the most frightful profanations, that Francesco Cenci was born. He was the son of Monsignor Niccolo Cenci, afterwards an apostolic treasurer during the pontificate of Pius V. Under this venerable prelate, who occupied himself much more with the spiritual than the temporal administration of his kingdom, Niccolo Cenci took advantage of his spiritual head's abstraction of worldly matters to amass a net revenue of a hundred and sixty thousand piastres, about thirty-two thousand pounds of our money. Francesco Cenci, who was his only son, inherited this fortune. His youth was spent under popes so occupied with the schism of Luther that they had no time to think of anything else. The result was that Francesco Cenci, inheriting vicious instincts and master of an immense fortune which enabled him to purchase immunity, abandoned himself to all the evil passions of his fiery and passionate temperament. Five times during his profligate career, imprisoned for abominable crimes, he only succeeded in procuring his liberation by the payment of two hundred thousand piastres, or about one million francs. It should be explained that popes at this time were in great need of money. The lawless profligacy of Francesco Cenci first began seriously to attract public attention under the pontificate of Gregory the Thirteenth. This reign offered marvellous facilities for the development of a reputation such as that which this reckless Italian Don Juan seemed bent on acquiring. Under the Bolognese Bon Campo, a free hand was given to those able to pay both assassins and judges. Rape and murder were so common that public justice scarcely troubled itself with these trifling things if nobody appeared to prosecute the guilty parties. The good Gregory had his reward for his easy-going indulgence. He was spared to rejoice over the massacre of St. Bartholomew. Francesco Cenci was at the time of which we are speaking a man of forty-four, forty-five years of age, about five feet four inches in height, symmetrically proportioned and very strong, although rather thin. His hair was streaked with grey. His eyes were large and expressive, although the upper eyelids drooped somewhat. His nose was long, his lips were thin, and wore habitually a pleasant smile, except when his eye perceived an enemy. At this moment his features assumed a terrible expression, and on such occasions, and whenever moved or even slightly irritated, he was seized with a fit of nervous trembling, which lasted long after the cause which provoked it had passed. An adept in all manly exercises, and especially in horsemanship, he sometimes used to ride without stopping from Rome to Naples, a distance of forty-one leagues, passing through the forests of San Germano and the Pontine marshes heedless of brigands, although he might be alone and unarmed save for his sword and dagger. When his horse fell from fatigue, he bought another. Were the owner unwilling to sell, he took it by force. If resistance were made, he struck, and always with the point, never the hilt. In most cases, being well known throughout the Papal States as a free-handed person, nobody tried to thwart him, some yielding through fear, others from motives of interest. Impious, sacrilegious, and atheistical, he never entered a church except to profane its sanctity. It was said of him that he had a morbid appetite for novelties in crime, and that there was no outrage he would not commit if he hoped by so doing to enjoy a new sensation. At the age of about forty-five he had married a very rich woman, whose name is not mentioned by any chronicler. She died, leaving him seven children, five boys and two girls. He then married Lucrezia Petroni, a perfect beauty of the Roman type, except for the ivory pallor of her complexion. By this second marriage he had no children. As if Francesco Cenci were void of all natural affection, he hated his children, and was at no pains to conceal his feelings towards them. On one occasion, when he was building in the courtyard of his magnificent palace near the Tiber a chapel dedicated to St. Thomas, he remarked to the architect when instructing him to design a family vault, 
that is where I hope to bury them all. The architect often subsequently admitted that he was so terrified by the fiendish laugh which accompanied these words, that had not Francesco Cenci's work been extremely profitable, he would have refused to go on with it. As soon as his three eldest boys, Giacomo, Cristoforo, and Rocco, were out of their tutor's hands, in order to get rid of them he sent them to the University of Salamanca, where, out of sight, they were out of mind, for he thought no more about them, and did not even send them the means of subsistence. In these straits, after struggling for some months against their wretched plight, the lads were obliged to leave Salamanca and beg their way home, tramping barefoot through France and Italy till they made their way back to Rome, where they found their father harsher and more unkind than ever. End of section 29. Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman. Section 30 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Carney. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 30. The Chenchi, Part 2. This happened in the early part of the reign of Clement VIII, famed for his justice. The three youths resolved to apply to him to grant them an allowance after their father's immense income. They consequently repaired to Frascati, where the Pope was building the beautiful Aldo Brandini villa, and stated their case. The Pope admitted the justice of their claims, and ordered Francesco to allow each of them two thousand crowns a year. He endeavored by every possible means to evade this decree but the Pope's orders were too stringent to be disobeyed. About this period he was for the third time imprisoned for infamous crimes. His three sons then again petitioned the Pope, alleging that their father dishonored the family name, and praying that the extreme rigor of the law, a capital sentence, should be enforced in his case. The Pope pronounced this conduct unnatural and odious, and drove them with ignominy from his presence. As for Francesco, he escaped as on the two previous occasions, by the payment of a large sum of money. It will be readily understood that his son's conduct on this occasion did not improve their father's disposition towards them, but as their independent pensions enabled them to keep out of his way, his rage fell with all the greater intensity on his two unhappy daughters. Their situation soon became so intolerable that the elder, contriving to elude the close supervision under which she was kept, forwarded to the Pope a petition relating the cruel treatment to which she was subjected, and praying His Holiness either to give her in marriage or place her in a convent. Clement VIII took pity on her, compelled Francesco Cenci to give her a dowry of sixty thousand crowns, and married her to Carlo Gabrielli, of a noble family of Gubbio. Francesco was driven nearly frantic with rage when he saw this victim released from his clutches. About the same time, death relieved him from two other encumbrances. His sons Rocco and Cristoforo were killed within a year of each other, the latter by a bungling medical practitioner whose name is unknown, the former by a Paolo Corso di Massa, in the streets of Rome. This came as a relief to Francesco, whose avarice pursued his sons even after their death, for he intimated to the priest that he would not spend a farthing on funeral services. They were accordingly borne to the paupers' graves, which he had caused to be prepared for them, and when he saw them both interred, he cried out that he was well rid of such good-for-nothing children, but that he should be perfectly happy only when the remaining five were buried with the first two, and that when he had got rid of the last, he himself would burn down his palace as a bonfire to celebrate the event. But Francesco took every precaution against his second daughter, Beatrice Cenci, following the example of her elder sister. She was then a child of twelve or thirteen years of age, beautiful and innocent as an angel, 
her long fair hair a beauty seen so rarely in italy that raffaelli believing it divine has appropriated it to all his madonnas curtained a lovely forehead and fell in flowing locks over her shoulders her azure eyes bore a heavenly expression she was of middle height exquisitely proportioned and during the rare moments when a gleam of happiness allowed her natural character to display itself she was lively joyous and sympathetic but at the same time evinced a firm and decided disposition to make sure of her custody francesco kept her shut up in a remote apartment of his palace the key of which he kept in his own possession there her unnatural and inflexible jailer daily brought her some food up to the age of thirteen which he had now reached he had behaved to her with the most extreme harshness and severity but now to poor beatrice's great astonishment he all at once became gentle and even tender beatrice was no child no longer her beauty expanded like a flower and francesco a stranger to no crime however heinous had marked her for his own brought up as she had been uneducated deprived of all society even that of her stepmother beatrice knew not good from evil her ruin was comparatively easy to com compass yet francesco to accomplish his diabolical purpose employed all the means at his command every night she was awakened by a concert of music which seemed to come from paradise when she mentioned this to her father he left her in this belief adding that if she proved gentle and obedient she would be rewarded by heavenly sights as well as heavenly sounds one night it came to pass that as the young girl was reposing her head supported on her elbow and listening to a delightful harmony the chamber door suddenly opened and from the darkness of her own room she beheld a suite of apartments brilliantly illuminated and sensuous with perfumes beautiful youths and girls half clad such as she had seen in the pictures of guido and raffaele moved to and fro in these apartments seeming full of joy and happiness these were the ministers to the pleasures of francesco who rich as a king every night revelled in the orgies of alexander the wedding revels of lucrezia and the excesses of tiberius at capri after an hour the door closed and the seductive vision vanished leaving beatrice full of trouble and amazement the night following the same apparition again presented itself only on this occasion francesco cenci undressed entered his daughter's room and invited her to join the fete hardly knowing what she did beatrice yet perceived the impropriety of yielding to her father's wishes she replied that not seeing her stepmother lucrezia petroni among all these women she dared not leave her bed to mix with persons who were unknown to her francesco threatened and prayed but threats and prayer were of no avail beatrice wrapped herself up in the bedclothes and obstinately refused to obey the next night she threw herself on her bed without undressing at the accustomed hour the door opened and the nocturnal spectacle reappeared this time lucrezia petroni was among the women who passed before beatrice's door violence had compelled her to undergo this humiliation beatrice was too far off to see her blushes and her tears francesco pointed out to her stepmother whom she had looked for in vain the previous evening as she could no longer make any opposition he led her covered with blushes and confusion into the middle of this orgy beatrice there saw incredible and infamous things nevertheless she resisted a long time an inward voice told her that this was horrible but francesco had the slow persistence of a demon to these sights calculated to stimulate her passions he added heresies designed to warp her mind he told her that the greatest saints venerated by the church were the issue of fathers and daughters and in the bed Beatrice committed a crime without even knowing it to be sin his brutality then knew no bounds he forced lucrezia and beatrice to share the same bed threatening his wife to kill her if she disclosed to his daughter by a single word that there was anything odious in such an intercourse so matters went on for about three years 
At this time Francesca was obliged to make a journey and to leave the women alone and free. The first thing Lucrezia did was to enlighten Beatrice on the infamy of the life they were leading. They then together prepared a memorial to the Pope, in which they laid before him a statement of all the blows and outrages they had suffered. But before leaving, Francesco Cenci had taken precautions. Every person about the Pope was in his pay, or hoped to be. The petition never reached his holiness, and the two poor women, remembering that Clement VIII had on a former occasion driven Giacomo and Cristoforo and the Rocco from his presence, thought they were included in the same prescription, and looked upon themselves as abandoned to their fate. When matters were in this state, Giacomo, taking advantage of his father's absence, came to pay them a visit with a friend of his, an abbey named Guerra. He was a young man of twenty-five or twenty-six, belonging to one of the most noble families in Rome, of a bold, resolute, and courageous character, and idolized by all the Roman ladies for his beauty. To classical features he added blue eyes, swimming in poetic sentiment. His hair was long and fair, with chestnut beard and eyebrows. Add to these attractions a highly educated mind, natural eloquence expressed by a musical and penetrating voice, and the reader may form some idea of Monsignor Abbey the Guerra. No sooner had he seen Beatrice than he fell in love with her. On her side she was not slow to return the sympathy of the young priest. The Council of Trent had not been held at that time, consequently ecclesiastics were not precluded from marriage. It was therefore decided that on the return of Francesco the Abbey Guerra should demand the hand of Beatrice from her father, and the women, happy in the absence of their master, continued to live on, hoping for better things to come. End of section 30《Section 31 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Carney. — Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 31. The Chenchi, Part 3. After three or four months, during which no one knew where he was, Francesco returned. The very first night he wished to resume his intercourse with Beatrice, but she was no longer the same person. The timid and submissive child had become a girl of decided will. Strong in her love for the abbey, she resisted alike prayers, threats, and blows. The wrath of Francesco fell upon his wife, whom he accused of betraying him. He gave her a violent thrashing. Lucrezia Petroni was a veritable Roman she-wolf, passionate alike in love and vengeance. She endured all, but pardoned nothing. Some days after this the Abbe Guerra arrived at the Chenchi Palace to carry out what had been arranged. Rich, young, noble, and handsome, everything would seem to promise him success, yet he was rudely dismissed by Francesco. The first refusal did not daunt him. He returned to the charge a second time, and yet a third, insisting upon the suitableness of such a union. At length Francesco, losing patience, told this obstinate lover that a reason existed why Beatrice could be neither his wife nor any other man's. Guerra demanded what this reason was. Francesco replied, "'Because she is my mistress!' Monsignor Guerra turned pale at this answer, although at first he did not believe a word of it. But when he saw the smile with which Francesco Cenci accompanied his words, he was compelled to believe that, terrible though it was, the truth had been spoken. For three days he sought an interview with Beatrice in vain. At length he succeeded in finding her. His last hope was her denial of this horrible story. Beatrice confessed all. Henceforth there was no human hope for the two lovers. An impassable gulf separated them. They parted bathed in tears, promising to love one another always. Up to that time the two women had not formed any criminal resolution, and possibly the tragical incident might never have happened, 
had not Francesco one night returned into his daughter's room and violently forced her into the commission of fresh crime. Henceforth the doom of Francesco was irrevocably pronounced. As we have said, the mind of Beatrice was susceptible to the best and the worst influences. It could attain excellence and descend to guilt. She went and told her mother of the fresh outrage she had undergone. This roused in the heart of the other woman the sting of her own wrongs, and, stimulating each other's desire for revenge, they decided upon the murder of Francesco. Guerra was called in to this council of death. His heart was a prey to hatred and revenge. He undertook to communicate with Giacomo Cenci, without whose concurrence the women would not act, as he was the head of the family, when his father was left out of account. Giacomo entered readily into the conspiracy. It will be remembered what he had formerly suffered from his father. Since that time he had married, and the close-fisted old man had left him, with his wife and children, to languish in poverty. Guerra's house was selected to meet in and concert matters. Giacomo hired a sbirro named Marzio and Guerra a second named Olimpio. Both these men had private reasons for committing the crime, one being actuated by love, the other by hatred. Marzio, who was in the service of Giacomo, had often seen Beatrice and loved her, but with that silent and hopeless love which devours the soul. When he conceived that the proposed crime would draw him nearer to Beatrice, he accepted his part in it without any demur. As for Olimpio, he hated Francesco, because the latter had caused him to lose the post of Castellan of Rocco Petrella, a fortified stronghold in the kingdom of Naples, belonging to Prince Colonna. Almost every year Francesco Cenci spent some months at Rocco Petrella with his family, for Prince Colonna a noble and magnificent but needy prince, had much esteem for Francesco, whose purse he found extremely useful. It had so happened that Francesco, being dissatisfied with Olimpio, complained about him to Prince Colonna, and he was dismissed. After several consultations between the Cenci family, the Abbey and the Zbiri, the following plan of action was decided upon. The period when Francesco Cenci was accustomed to go to Rocco Petrella was approaching. It was arranged that Olimpio, conversant with the district and its inhabitants, should collect a party of a dozen Neapolitan bandits and conceal them in a forest through which the travellers would have to pass. Upon a given signal, the whole family were to be seized and carried off, a heavy ransom was to be demanded, and the sons were to be sent back to Rome to raise the sum but under pretext of inability to do so, they were to allow the time fixed by the bandits to lapse, when Francesca was to be put to death. Thus all suspicions of a plot would be avoided, and the real assassins would escape justice. This well-devised scheme was nevertheless unsuccessful. When Francesco left Rome, the scouts sent in advance by the conspirators could not find the bandits, the latter, not being warned beforehand, failed to come down before the passage of the travellers, who arrived safe and sound at Rocco Petrella. The bandits, after having patrolled the road in vain, came to the conclusion that their prey had escaped, and unwilling to stay any longer in a place where they had already spent a week, went off in quest of better luck elsewhere. Francesco had in the meantime settled down in the fortress, and to be more free to tyrannize over Lucrezia and Beatrice, sent back to Rome Giacomo and his two other sons. He then recommenced his infamous attempts upon Beatrice, and with such persistence that she resolved herself to accomplish the deed which at first she desired to entrust to other hands. Olimpio and Marzio, who had nothing to fear from justice, remained lurking about the castle. One day Beatrice saw them from a window, and made signs that she had something to communicate to them. The same night Olimpio, who having been Castellan, knew all the approaches to the fortress, made his way there with his companion. Beatrice awaited them at a window which looked on to a secluded courtyard. She gave them letters which she had written to her brother and to Monsignor Guerra. The former was to approve, as he had done before, 
the murder of their father, for she would do nothing without his sanction. As for Monsignor Guerra, he was to pay Olympio a thousand piastres, half the stipulated sum. Marcio, acting out of pure love for Beatrice, whom he worshipped as a Madonna, which, observing, the girl gave him a handsome scarlet mantle, trimmed with gold lace, telling him to wear it for love of her. As for the remaining moiety, he was to be paid when the death of the old man had placed his wife and daughter in possession of his fortune. The two sbirri departed, and the imprisoned conspirators anxiously awaited their return. On the day fixed, they were seen again. Monsignor Guerra had paid the thousand piastres, and Giacomo had given his consent. Nothing now stood in the way of the execution of this terrible deed, which was fixed for the 8th of September, the day of the Nativity of the Virgin. But Signora Lucrezia, a very devout person, having noticed this circumstance, would not be a party to the committal of a double sin. The matter was therefore deferred till the next day, the ninth. That evening, the ninth of September, 1598, the two women, supping with the old man, mixed some narcotic with his wine so adroitly that, suspicious though he was, he never detected it, and having swallowed the potion, soon fell into a deep sleep. The evening previous, Marzio and Olympio had been admitted into the castle, where they had lain concealed all night and all day, for as will be remembered, the assassination would have been effected the day before had it not been for the religious scruples of Signor Lucrezia Petroni. Towards midnight, Beatrice fetched them out of their hiding place and took them to her father's chamber, the door of which she herself opened. The assassins entered, and the two women awaited the issue in the room adjoining. After a moment, seeing the Sibiri reappear, pale and nerveless, shaking their heads without speaking, they at once inferred that nothing had been done. "'What is the matter?' cried Beatrice. "'And what hinders you?' "'It is a cowardly act,' replied the assassins, "'to kill a poor old man in his sleep. At the thought of his age we were struck with pity.' Then Beatrice disdainfully raised her head, and in a deep, firm voice thus reproached him, is it possible that you, who pretend to be brave and strong, have not the courage to kill a sleeping old man? How would it be if he were awake, and thus you steal our money? Very well, since your cowardice compels me to do so, I will kill my father myself, but you will not long survive him. Hearing those words, the Zbiri felt ashamed of their irresolution, and indicating by signs that they would fulfill their compact they entered the room, accompanied by the two women. As they had said, a ray of moonlight shone through the open window and brought into prominence the tranquil face of the old man, the sight of whose white hair so affected them. This time they showed no mercy. One of them carried two great nails, such as those portrayed in pictures of the crucifixion. The other bore a mallet. The first placed a nail upright over the one of the old man's eyes, the other struck it with a hammer, and drove it into his head. The throat was pierced in the same way with the second nail, and thus the guilty soul, stained throughout its career with crimes of violence, was in its turn violently torn from the body, which lay writhing on the floor where it had rolled. The young girl then, faithful to her word, handed the Sibiri a large purse containing the rest of the sum agreed upon, and they left. When they found themselves alone, the women drew the nails out of the wounds, wrapped the corpse in a sheet, and dragged it through the room towards a small rampart, intending to throw it down into a garden which had been allowed to run to waste. They hoped that the old man's death would be attributed to his having accidentally fallen off the terrace on his way in the dark to a closet at the end of the gallery, but their strength failed them when they reached the door of the last room and while resting there, Lucrezia perceived the two sbirri sharing the money before making their escape. At her call they came to her, carried the corpse to the rampart, and, from a spot pointed out by the women, where the terrace was unfenced by any papare, they threw it into an elder tree below, whose branches retained it suspended. When the body was found the following morning hanging in the branches of the elder tree, 
everybody supposed as beatrice and her stepmother had foreseen stepping over the edge of the terrace in the dark had thus met his end the body was so scratched and disfigured that no one noticed the wounds made by the two nails the ladies as soon as the news was imparted to them came out from their rooms weeping and lamenting in so natural a manner as to disarm any suspicions the only person who formed any was a laundress to whom beatrice entrusted the sheet in which her father's body had been wrapped accounting for its bloody condition by a lame explanation which the laundress accepted without question or pretended to do so and immediately after the funeral the mourners returned to rome hoping at length to enjoy quietude and peace for some time indeed they did enjoy tranquillity perhaps poisoned by remorse but ere long retribution pursued them the court of naples hearing of the sudden and unexpected death of francesco cenci and conceiving some suspicions of violence dispatched a royal commissioner to petrella to exhume the body and to make minute inquiries if there appeared to be adequate grounds for doing so on his arrival all the domestics in the castle were placed under arrest and sent in chains to naples no incriminating proofs however were found except in the evidence of the laundress who deposed that beatrice had given her a blood-stained sheet to wash this clue led to terrible consequences for further question she declared that she could not believe the explanation given to account for its condition the evidence was sent to the roman court but at that period it did not appear strong enough to warrant the arrest of the chenchi family who remained undisturbed for many months during which time the youngest boy died of the five brothers there only remained giacomo the eldest and bernardo the youngest but one nothing prevented them from escaping to venice or florence but they remained quietly in rome end of section thirty one Section 32 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 32. The Chenchi. Part 4. Meantime, Monsignor Guerra received private information that shortly before the death of francesco marzio and olimpio had been seen prowling round the castle and that the neapolitan police had received orders to arrest them the monsignor was a most wary man and very difficult to catch napping when warned in time he immediately hired two other sbirri to assassinate marzio and olimpio the one commissioned to put olimpio out of the way came across him at terni and conscientiously did his work with a poniard but marzio's man unfortunately arrived at naples too late and found his bird already in the hands of the police he was put to the torture and confessed everything his disposition was sent to rome whither he shortly afterwards followed it to be confronted with the accused warrants were immediately issued for the arrest of giacomo bernardo lucrezia and beatrice they were at first confined in the Chenchi Palace under a strong guard, but the proofs against them becoming stronger and stronger, they were removed to the castle of Corte Savella, where they were confronted with Marzio. But they obstinately denied both any complicity in the crime and any knowledge of the assassin. Beatrice, above all, displayed the greatest assurance, demanding to be the first to be confronted with Marzio, whose mendacity she affirmed with such calm dignity that he, more than ever smitten by her beauty determined since he could not live for her to save her by his death consequently he declared all his statements to be false and asked forgiveness from god and from beatrice neither threats nor tortures could make him recant and he died firm in his denial under frightful tortures the chenchi then thought themselves safe god's justice however still pursued them the sbirro who had killed olimpio happened to be arrested for another crime and making a clean breast confessed that he had been employed by monsignor guerra to put out of the way a fellow assassin named olimpio who knew too many of the monsignor's secrets luckily for himself monsignor guerra heard of this opportunely 
a man of infinite resource he lost not a moment in timid or irresolute plans but as it happened that at that very moment when he was warned the charcoal dealer who supplied his house with fuel was at hand he sent for him purchased his silence with a handsome bribe and then buying for almost their weight in gold the dirty old clothes which he wore he assumed these cut off all his beautiful cherished fair hair stained his beard smudged his face bought two asses laden with charcoal and limped up and down the streets of rome crying charcoal charcoal then whilst all the detectives were hunting high and low for him he got out of the city met a company of merchants under escort joined them and reached naples where he embarked what ultimately became of him was never known it has been asserted but without confirmation that he succeeded in reaching france and enlisted in a swiss regiment in the pay of henry fourth the confession of the sabiro and the disappearance of monsignor guerra left no moral doubt of the guilt of the cenci they were consequently sent from the castle to the prison the two brothers when put to the torture broke down and confessed their guilt lucrezia petroni's full habit of body rendered her unable to bear the torture of the rope and on being suspended in the air begged to be lowered when she confessed all she knew as for beatrice she continued unmoved neither promises threats nor torture had any effect upon her she bore everything unflinchingly and the judge ulysses moscati himself famous though he was in such matters failed to draw from her a single incriminating word unwilling to take any further responsibility he referred the case to clement eight and the pope conjecturing that the judge had been too lenient in applying the torture to a young and beautiful roman lady took it out of his hands and entrusted it to another judge whose severity and insensibility to emotion were undisputed this latter reopened the whole interrogatory and as beatrice up to that time had only been subjected to the ordinary torture he gave instructions to apply both the ordinary and extraordinary this was the rope and pulley one of the most terrible inventions ever devised by the most ingenious of tormentors to make the nature of this horrid torture plain to our readers we give a detailed description of it adding an extract of the presiding judge's report of the case taken from the vatican manuscripts of the various forms of torture then used in rome the most common were the whistle the fire the sleepless and the rope the mildest the torture of the whistle was used only in the case of children and old persons it consisted in thrusting between the nails and the flesh reeds cut in the shape of whistles the fire frequently employed before the invention of the sleepless torture was simply roasting the soles of the feet before a hot fire the sleepless torture invented by marsilius was worked by forcing the accused into an angular frame of wood about five feet high the sufferer being stripped and his arms tied behind his back to the frame two men relieved every five hours sat beside him and roused him the moment he closed his eyes marsilius says he has never found a man a proof against this torture but here he claims more than he is justly entitled to farinacci states that out of one hundred accused persons subjected to it five only refused to confess a very satisfactory result for the inventor lastly comes the torture of the rope and pulley the most in vogue of all and known in other latin countries as the strapado it was divided into three degrees of intensity the slight the severe and the very severe the first or slight torture which consisted mainly in the apprehensions it caused comprised the threat of severe torture introduction into the torture chamber stripping and the tying of the rope in readiness for its appliance to increase the terror these preliminaries excited a pang of physical pain was added by tightening a cord round the wrists this often sufficed to extract a confession from women or men of highly strung nerves the second or severe torture consisted in fastening the sufferer stripped naked and his hands tied behind his back by the wrists to one end of a rope passed round a pulley bolted into the vaulted ceiling the other end being attached to a windlass by turning which he could be hoisted into the air and dropped again either slowly or with a jerk as ordered by the judge the suspension generally lasted during the recital of a pater noster an ave maria or a miserere if the accused persisted in his denial it was doubled 
this second degree the last of the ordinary torture was put in practice when the crime appeared reasonably probable but was not absolutely proved the third or very severe the first of the extraordinary forms of torture was so called when the sufferer having hung suspended by the wrists for sometimes a whole hour was swung about by the executioner either like the pendulum of a clock or by elevating him with a windlass and dropping him to within a foot or two of the ground if he stood this torture a thing almost unheard of seeing that it cut the flesh of the wrist to the bone and dislocated the limbs weights were attached to the feet thus doubling the torture this last form of torture was only applied when an atrocious crime had been proved to have been committed upon a sacred person such as a priest a cardinal a prince or an eminent and learned man having seen that beatrice was sentenced to the torture ordinary and extraordinary and having explained the nature of these tortures we proceed to quote the official report and as in reply to every question she would confess nothing we caused her to be taken by two officers and led from the prison to the torture chamber where the torturer was in attendance there after cutting off her hair he made her sit on a small stool undressed her pulled off her shoes tied her hands behind her back fastened them to a rope passed over a pulley bolted into the ceiling of the aforesaid chamber and wound up at the other end by a four-lever windlass worked by two men before hoisting her from the ground we again interrogated her touching the aforesaid parricide but notwithstanding the confessions of her brother and her stepmother which were again produced bearing their signatures she persisted in denying everything saying haul me about and do what you like with me i have spoken the truth and will tell you nothing else even if i were torn to pieces upon this we had her hoisted in the air by the wrists to the height of about two feet from the ground while we recited a pater noster and then again questioned her as to the facts and the circumstances of the aforesaid parricide but she would make no further answer only saying you are killing me you are killing me we then raised her to the elevation of four feet and began an ave maria but before our prayer was half finished she fainted away or pretended to do so we caused a bucket full of water to be thrown over her head feeling its coolness she recovered consciousness and cried my god i am dead you are killing me my god but this was all she would say we then raised her higher still and recited a miserere during which instead of joining in the prayer she shook convulsively and cried several times my god my god again questioned as to the aforesaid parricide she would confess nothing saying only that she was innocent and then again fainted away we caused more water to be thrown over her then she recovered her senses opened her eyes and cried o cursed executioners you are killing me you are killing me but nothing more would she say seeing which and that she persisted in her denial we ordered the torturer to proceed to the torture by jerks he accordingly hoisted her ten feet from the ground and when there we enjoined her to tell the truth but whether she would not or could not speak she answered only by a motion of the head indicating that she could say nothing seeing which we made a sign to the executioner to let go the rope and she fell with all her weight from the height of ten feet to that of two feet her arms from the shock were dislocated from the sockets she uttered a loud cry and swooned away we again caused water to be dashed in her face she returned to herself and again cried out infamous assassins you are killing me but were you to tear out my arms i would tell you nothing else upon this we ordered a weight of fifty pounds to be fastened to her feet but at this moment the door opened and many voices cried enough enough do not torture her any more these voices were those of giacomo bernardo and lucrezia petroni the judges perceiving the obstinacy of beatrice had ordered that the accused who had been separated for five months should be confronted they advanced into the torture chamber and seeing beatrice hanging by the wrists her arms disjointed and covered with blood giacomo cried out the sin is committed nothing further remains but to save our souls by repentance undergo death courageously and not suffer you to be thus tortured then said beatrice shaking her head as if to cast off grief 
Do you then wish to die? Since you wish it, be it so. Then turning to the officers, Untie me, said she. Read the examination to me, and what I have to confess, I will confess. What I have to deny, I will deny. Beatrice was then lowered and untied. A barber reduced the dislocation of her arms in the usual manner. The examination was read over to her, and as she had promised, she made a full confession. After this confession, at the request of the two brothers, they were all confined in the same prison. But the next day Giacomo and Bernardo were taken to the cells of Tordinona. As for the women, they remained where they were. End of section 32section thirty three of celebrated crimes volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org celebrated crimes volume one by alexander dumas translated by g b ives section thirty three the chenchi part five the Pope was so horrified on reading the particulars of the crime contained in the confessions that he ordered the culprits to be dragged by wild horses through the streets of Rome. But so barbarous a sentence shocked the public mind, so much so that many persons of princely rank petitioned the Holy Father on their knees, imploring him to reconsider his decree, or at least allow the accused to be heard in their defense. "'Tell me,' replied Clement VIII. Did they give their unhappy father time to be heard in his own defence, when they slew him in so merciless and degrading a fashion? At length, overcome by so many entreaties, he respited them for three days. The most eloquent and skilful advocates in Rome immediately busied themselves in preparing pleadings for so emotional a case, and on the day fixed for hearing appeared before his holiness. The first pleader was Niccolo degli Angeli, who spoke with such force and eloquence that the Pope, alarmed at the effect he was producing among the audience, passionately interrupted him. "'Are there then to be found,' he indignantly cried, "'among the Roman nobility children capable of killing their parents, and among Roman lawyers men capable of speaking in their defence? This is a thing we should never have believed.' nor even for a moment supposed it possible all were silent upon this terrible rebuke except farinacci who nerving himself with a strong sense of duty replied respectfully but firmly most holy father we are not here to defend criminals but to save the innocent for if we succeeded in proving that any of the accused acted in self-defence i hope that they will be exonerated in the eyes of your holiness for just as the law provides for cases in which the father may legally kill the child, so this holds good in the converse. We will therefore continue our pleadings on receiving leave from your holiness to do so. Clement VIII then showed himself as patient as he had previously been hasty, and heard the argument of Farinacci, who pleaded that Francesco Cenci had lost all the rights of a father from the day that he violated his daughter. In support of his contention he wished to put in the memorial sent by Beatrice to his holiness, petitioning him as her sister had done, to remove her from the paternal roof and place her in a convent. Unfortunately this petition had disappeared, and notwithstanding the minutest search among the papal documents, no trace of it could be found. The Pope had all the pleadings collected, and dismissed the advocates, who then retired, except Daltieri, who knelt before him, saying, Most holy father, I humbly ask pardon for appearing before you in this case, but I had no choice in the matter, being the advocate of the poor. The Pope kindly raised him, saying, Go, we are not surprised at your conduct, but at that of others, who protect and defend criminals. As the Pope took a great interest in this case, he sat up all night over it, studying it with Cardinal di San Marcello, a man of much acumen and great experience in criminal cases, 
Then, having summed it up, he sent a draft of his opinion to the advocates, who read it with great satisfaction, and entertained hopes that the lives of the convicted persons would be spared. For the evidence all went to prove that, even if the children had taken their father's life, all the provocation came from him, and that Beatrice in particular had been dragged into the part she had taken in this crime by the tyranny, wickedness, and brutality of her father. Under the influence of these considerations the Pope mitigated the severity of their prison life, and even allowed the prisoners to hope that their lives would not be forfeited. Amidst the general feeling of relief afforded to the public by these favors, another tragical event changed the papal mind and frustrated all his humane intentions. This was the atrocious murder of the Marchese di Santa Croce, a man seventy years of age, by his son Paolo, who stabbed him with a dagger in fifteen or twenty places, because the father would not promise to make Paolo his sole heir. The murderer fled and escaped. Clement VIII was horror-stricken at the increasing frequency of this crime of parricide. For the moment, however, he was unable to take action, having to go to Montcavallo to consecrate a titular bishop in the church of Santa Maria degli Angeli. But the day following, on Friday the 10th of September, 1599, at eight o'clock in the morning, he summoned Monsignor Taverna, governor of Rome, and said to him, Monsignor, we place in your hands the Cenci case, that you may carry out the sentence as speedily as possible. On his return to his palace, after leaving his holiness, the governor convened a meeting of all the criminal judges in the city, the result of the council being that all the Cenci were condemned to death. The final sentence was immediately known, and as this unhappy family inspired a constantly increasing interest, many cardinals spent the whole of the night either on horseback or in their carriages, making interest that, at least so far as the women were concerned, they should be put to death privately and in the prison, and that a free pardon should be granted to Bernardo, a poor lad only fifteen years of age, who, guiltless of any participation in the crime, yet found himself involved in its consequences. The one who interested himself most in the case was Cardinal Sforza, who nevertheless failed to elicit a single gleam of hope, so obdurate was his holiness. At length Faranacci, working on the conscience, succeeded, after long and urgent entreaties, and only at the last moment, that the life of Bernardo should be spared. From Friday evening the members of the Brotherhood of the Conforteria had gathered at the two prisons of Corte Savella and Tordinona. The preparations for the closing scene of the tragedy had occupied workmen on the bridge of Sant'Angelo all night, and it was not till five o'clock in the morning that the registrar entered the cell of Lucrezia and Beatrice to read their sentences to them. Both were sleeping, calm in the belief of a reprieve, the registrar woke them and told them that, judged by man, they must now prepare to appear before God. Beatrice was at first thunderstruck. She seemed paralyzed and speechless. Then she rose from bed, and, staggering as if intoxicated, recovered her speech, uttering despairing cries. Lucrezia heard the tidings with more firmness, and proceeded to dress herself to go to the chapel, exhorting Beatrice to resignation, but she, raving, wrung her hands and struck her head against the wall, streaking, To die, to die, am I to die unprepared, on a scaffold, on a gibbet? My God, my God! This fit led to a terrible paroxysm, after which the exhaustion of her body enabled her mind to recover its balance, and from that moment she became an angel of humility, an example of resignation. Her first request was for a notary to make her will. This was immediately complied with, and on his arrival she dictated its provisions with much calmness and precision. Its last clause desired her internment in the church of San Pietro in Montorio, for which she always had a strong attachment, as it commanded a view of her father's palace. She bequeathed five hundred crowns to the nuns of the Order of the Stigmata, 
and ordered that her dowry, amounting to fifteen thousand crowns, should be distributed in marriage portions to fifty poor girls. She selected the foot of the high altar as the place where she wished to be buried, over which hung the beautiful picture of the transfiguration, so often admired by her during her life. Following her example, Lucrezia in turn disposed of her property. She desired to be buried in the church of San Giorgio di Velobre, and left thirty-two thousand crowns to charities, with other pious legacies. Having settled their earthly affairs, they joined in prayer, reciting psalms, litanies, and prayers for the dying. At eight o'clock they confessed, heard Mass, and received the sacraments, after which Beatrice, observing to her stepmother that the rich dresses they wore were out of place on the scaffold, ordered two to be made in nun's fashion, that is to say, gathered at the neck, with long wide sleeves. That for Lucrezia was made for black cotton stuff, Beatrice's of taffetas. In addition, she had a small black turban made to place on her head. These dresses, with cords for girdles, were brought them. They were placed on a chair, while the women continued to pray. The time appointed being near at hand, they were informed that their last moment was approaching. Then Beatrice, who was still on her knees, rose with a tranquil and almost joyful countenance. Mother, she said, the moment of our suffering is impending. I think we had better dress in these clothes, and help one another at our toilet for the last time. They then put on the dresses provided, girt themselves with the cords. Beatrice placed her turban on her head, and they awaited the last summons. In the meantime Giacomo and Bernardo, whose sentences had been read to them, awaited also the moment of their death. About ten o'clock the members of the Confraternity of Mercy, a Florentine order, arrived at the prison of Tordinona, and halted on the threshold with the crucifix, awaiting the appearance of the unhappy youths. Here a serious accident nearly happened. As many persons were at the prison windows to see the prisoners come out, someone accidentally threw down a large flower-pot full of earth, which fell into the street, and narrowly missed one of the confraternity, who was amongst the torch-bearers just before the crucifix. It passed so close to the torch as to extinguish the flame in its descent. At this moment the gates opened and Giacomo appeared first on the threshold. He fell on his knees, adoring the holy crucifix with great devotion. He was completely covered with a large mourning cloak, under which his bare breast was exposed to be torn by the red-hot pincers of the executioner, which were lying ready in a chafing-dish fixed to the cart. Having ascended the vehicle in which the executioner placed him, so as more readily to perform this office, Bernardo came out, and was thus addressed on his appearance by the fiscal of Rome. Signor Bernardo Cenci, in the name of our blessed Redeemer, our Holy Father, the Pope, spares your life, with the sole condition that you accompany your relatives to the scaffold and to their death, and never forget to pray for those with whom you were condemned to die. At this unexpected intelligence, a loud murmur of joy spread among the crowd, and the members of the confraternity immediately untied the small mask which covered the youth's eyes, for, owing to his tender age, it had been thought proper to conceal the scaffold from his sight. Then the executioner, having disposed of Giacomo, came down from the car to take Bernardo, whose pardon, being formally communicated to him, he took off his handcuffs and placed him alongside his brother, covering him up with a magnificent cloak embroidered with gold, for the neck and shoulders of the poor lad had already been bared as a preliminary to his decapitation. People were surprised to see such a cloak in the possession of the executioner, but were told that it was the one given by Beatrice to Marzio to pledge him to the murder of her father which fell to the executioner as a prerequisite after the execution of the assassin. The sight of the great assemblage of people produced such an effect upon the boy that he fainted. End of section 33
Section 34 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 34. The Chenchi, Part 6. The procession then proceeded to the prison of Corte Savella, marching to the sound of funeral chants. At its gates the sacred crucifix halted for the women to join. They soon appeared, fell on their knees, and worshipped the holy symbol as the others had done. The march to the scaffold was then resumed. The two female prisoners followed the last row of penitents in single file, veiled to the waist with the distinction that Lucrezia, as a widow, wore a black veil and high-heeled slippers of the same hue, with bows of ribbon, as was the fashion, whilst Beatrice, as a young unmarried girl, wore a silk flat cap to match her corsage, with a plush hood, which fell over her shoulders and covered her violet frock, white slippers with white high heels, ornated with gold rosettes and cherry-coloured fringe. The arms of both were untrammeled, except for a thin slack cord which left their hands free to carry a crucifix and a handkerchief. During the night a lofty scaffold had been erected on the bridge of Sant'Angelo, and the plank and block were placed thereon. Above the block was hung, from a large cross-beam, a ponderous axe, which, guided by two grooves, fell with its whole weight at the touch of a spring. In this formation the procession wended its way towards the bridge of Sant'Angelo. Lucrezia, the more broken down of the two, wept bitterly, but Beatrice was firm and unmoved. On arriving at the open space before the bridge, the women were led into a chapel where they were shortly joined by Giacomo and Bernardo. They remained together for a few moments, when the brothers were led away to the scaffold, although one was to be executed last, and the other was pardoned. But when they had mounted the platform, Bernardo fainted a second time, and as the executioner was approaching to his assistance, some of the crowd, supposing that his object was to decapitate him, cried loudly, "'He is pardoned!' The executioner reassured them by seating Bernardo near the block, Giacomo kneeling on the other side. Then the executioner descended, entered the chapel, and reappeared, leading Lucrezia, who was the first to suffer. At the foot of the scaffold he tied her hands behind her back, tore open the top of her corsage, so as to uncover her shoulders, gave her the crucifix to kiss, and led her to the step-ladder, which she ascended with great difficulty, on account of her extreme stoutness. Then, on her reaching the platform, he removed the veil which covered her head. On this exposure of her features to the immense crowd, Lucrezia shuddered from head to foot. Then, her eyes full of tears, she cried with a loud voice, "'Oh, my God! Have mercy upon me!' and do you, brethren, pray for my soul. Having uttered these words, not knowing what was required of her, she turned to Alessandro, the chief executioner, and asked what she was to do. He told her to bestride the plank and lie prone upon it, which she did with great trouble and timidity. But as she was unable, on account of the fullness of her bust, to lay her neck upon the block, this had to be raised by placing a billet of wood underneath it. All this time, the poor woman, suffering even more from shame than from fear, was kept in suspense. At length, when she was properly adjusted, the executioner touched the spring, the knife fell, and the decapitated head, falling on the platform of the scaffold, bounded two or three times in the air, to the general horror. The executioner then seized it, showed it to the multitude, and wrapping it in black taffetas, 
placed it with the body on a bier at the foot of the scaffold. Whilst arrangements were made for the decapitation of Beatrice, several stands full of spectators broke down. Some people were killed by this accident, and still more lamed and injured. The machine being now rearranged and washed, the executioner returned to the chapel to take charge of Beatrice, who, on seeing the sacred crucifix, said some prayers for her soul, and on her hands being tied, cried out, God grant that you be binding this body unto corruption, and loosing this soul unto life eternal. She then arose, proceeded to the platform, where she devoutly kissed the stigmata, then, leaving her slippers at the foot of the scaffold, she nimbly ascended the ladder, and instructed beforehand, promptly lay down on the plank, without exposing her naked shoulders. But her precautions to shorten the bitterness of death were of no avail, for the Pope, knowing her impetuous disposition, and fearing lest she might be led into the commission of some sin between absolution and death, had given orders that the moment Beatrice was extended on the scaffold, a signal gun should be fired from the castle of Sant'Angelo, which was done, to the great astonishment of everybody, including Beatrice herself, who, not expecting this explosion, raised herself almost upright. The Pope, meanwhile, who was praying at Monte Cavallo, gave her absolution, in articulo mortis. About five minutes thus passed, during which the sufferer waited with her head replaced on the block. At length, when the executioner judged that the absolution had been given, he released the spring, and the axe fell. A gruesome sight was then afforded, whilst the head bounced away on one side of the block. On the other the body rose erect, as if about to step backwards. The executioner exhibited the head, and disposed of it, and the body as before. He wished to place Beatrice's body with that of her stepmother, but the Brotherhood of Mercy took it out of her hands, and as one of them was attempting to lay it on the bier, it slipped from him and fell from the scaffold to the ground below, the dress being partially torn from the body, which was so besmeared with dust and blood that much time was occupied in washing it. Poor Bernardo was so overcome by this horrible scene that he swooned away for the third time, and it was necessary to revive him with stimulants to witness the fate of his elder brother. The turn of Giacomo at length arrived. He had witnessed the death of his stepmother and his sister, and his clothes were covered with their blood. The executioner approached him and tore off his cloak, exposing his bare breast covered with the wounds caused by the grip of red-hot pincers. In this state, and half-naked, he rose to his feet, and turning to his brother said, Bernardo, if in my examination I have compromised and accused you, I have done so falsely and although I have already disavowed this declaration, I repeat, at the moment of appearing before God, that you are innocent, and that it is a cruel abuse of justice to compel you to witness this frightful spectacle. The executioner then made him kneel down, bound his legs to one of the beams erected on the scaffold, and having bandaged his eyes, shattered his head with a blow of his mallet. Then, in the sight of all, he hacked his body into four quarters. The official party then left, taking with them Bernardo, who, being in a state of high fever, was bled and put to bed. The corpses of the two ladies were laid out, each on its own bier, under the statue of St. Paul at the foot of the bridge, with four torches of white wax which burned until four o'clock in the afternoon. Then, along with the remains of Giacomo, they were taken to the church of San Giovanni de Colato. Finally, about nine in the evening, the body of Beatrice, covered with flowers and attired in the dress worn at her execution, was carried to the church of San Pietro in Montorio, with fifty lighted torches, and followed by the brethren of the Order of the Stigmata and all the Franciscan monks in Rome. There, agreeably to her wish, 
It was buried at the foot of the high altar. The same evening, Signora Lucrezia was interred, as she had desired to be, in the church of San Giorgio di Velobre. All Rome may be said to have been present at this tragedy. Carriages, horses, foot people, and cars crowding, as it were, upon one another. The day was unfortunately so hot, and the sun so scorching, that many persons fainted. Others returned home, stricken with fever, and some even died during the night owing to sunstroke from exposure during the three hours occupied by the execution. The Tuesday following, the 14th of September, being the Feast of the Holy Cross, the Brotherhood of San Marcello, by special license of the Pope, set at liberty the unhappy Bernardo Cenci, with the condition of paying within the year 2,500 Roman crowns to the Brotherhood of the Most Holy Trinity of Pope Sixtus as may be found to-day recorded in their archives. Having now seen the tomb, if you desire to form a more vivid impression of the principal actors in this tragedy than can be derived from a narrative, pay a visit to the Barberini Gallery, where you will see, with five other masterpieces by Guido, the portrait of Beatrice, taken, some say the night before her execution, others during her progress to the scaffold. It is the head of a lovely girl, wearing a headdress composed of a turban with a lappet. The hair is of a rich, fair chestnut hue. The dark eyes are moistened with recent tears. A perfectly formed nose surmounts an infantile mouth. Unfortunately, the loss of tone in that picture, since it was painted, has destroyed the original fair complexion. The age of the subject may be twenty or perhaps twenty-two years. Near this portrait is that of Lucrezia Petrani. The small head indicates a person below the middle height. The attributes are those of a Roman matron in her pride, her high complexion, graceful contour, straight nose, black eyebrows, and expression at the same time imperious and a voluptuous indicate this character to the life. A smile still seems to linger on the charming, dimpled cheeks and perfect mouth mentioned by the chronicler, and her face is exquisitely framed by luxuriant curls falling from her forehead in graceful profusion. As for Giacomo and Bernardo, as no portraits of them are in existence, we are obliged to gather an idea of their appearance from the manuscript which has enabled us to compile this sanguinary history. They are thus described by the eyewitness of the closing scene. Giacomo was short, well-made, and strong, with black hair and beard. He appeared to be about twenty-six years of age. Poor Bernardo was the image of his sister, so nearly resembling her that when he mounted the scaffold his long hair and girlish face led people to suppose him to be Beatrice herself. He might be fourteen or fifteen years of age. The peace of God be with them. End of section 34 Recording by Stephen Carney, Nina, Wisconsin End of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexander Dumas-Père Translated by G. B. Ives